This is the Cutting Edge on IRFM my next Wednesday. Sean Price. No, no, which part of them man there? One it wonder. I don't hear them make no more music. I don't know which part of them there. Anybody know there which part of Sean Price, the man? The bridge with the sing that tune, yeah? Man, may I tell you them look a tune there from them time there. Okay, so we depend on the Wednesday, yeah? The eve of the eve of Rebel Salute, Big Show, Two Day, Reggae Music, Continuously. We will be there. We will be hosting one of the night, them two. We hear that a lot of people is here. A lot of people is here. We give thanks to hear that because you know, say, I'm not talking about authentic. Because you have some show I keep on you know, and I tell you, it not do nothing to help the music in its upliftment. It come like a match down and broke down business are going on. And people are glorified in the match down and broke down. I don't know how people cannot look upon media could say. And I go on like say something relevant. The thing just gone. And we are intelligent people. Well, we never say them intelligent. We see people who are supposed to be intelligent. I go on like say it's something magnificent and beautiful that take place. When really and truly the music are broke down. And some of them show you help for broke it down too. Some of these shows help for broke down the thing. That is why I say the biggest selling group them right now is groups outside of Jamaica. We never come to Jamaica yet. Some white people. Because them take the authentic version of the music. And just duplicate it and just gone out there with it now and boom. Meanwhile, we there so a praise and a yell up mediocrity. We are praise and a yell up stupidity, ignorance. Make people who ignorant and upon the voyage of stupid become heroes and celebrities. I refuse to make a man turn my head. And make me start to believe, say, foolishness are beauty. And dirt is stupid, is, is, is beautiful. I refuse to listen to any artist. We are going like them idiots and stupid. Make me feel like, say, yes, that figure, no, that's a lick and that's a run things. Because when you go down like the wall with them, I mean, really. Look where the music did there. Look where the music do for Jamaica. Look where the music do for Jamaican people. And you have some youth now just come and just take it and broke it down. You know, I'm like a corner. You know, I'm like a version of mixtapes. Where my claim about mixtape around the corner. When you listen to it back, you say, what weird? Where the intelligence there? Where the youth them mind there? That man cannot do stupidness and take it as some serious advancement in the music. When you know, say, nah, get nowhere more than a next session. It's a terrible, terrible feeling, man. When you know, say, once and once come build up the thing and build up the thing and the thing get international and some youth just come around the corner and want to do pure foolishness. And people have praised the foolishness. Oh man, can I listen to a man and chat foolishness and, 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 and put work for that woman and I need to man and I mean for years they might do it, but I mean it gets away now that it gets graphic, more graphic now. And you have youth who's supposed to be intelligent. Youth who's supposed to be intelligent. Glorifying of them madness there. Wow. 
And we will mind there, we will heart there, we will soul there. We will have no soul again. That's why I said the thing gets away. Because all aspects of the Jamaican vibes match long. Four new agents have been activated. Pandey. Long time I don't see you, trust me. Wow. Okay. So, we see the government make a little nasty move again. For the people in Jamaica. I don't know how these people. We see a project we're supposed to cost 50 million dollars going cost the government, the, the Jamaican people almost 200 million. How can some where them get them where them get them them where the people them look after money again? Where them get them accountant from? Can you budget out something for cost fifty million dollar? And one man out of the whole of that I get that? One somebody when them budget out him expense. It come up to fifty million dollar, but yet still them say the whole thing I will cost fifty million dollar. Something must be wrong with me, to write it. No, something wrong with me because me I look at this thing and me I say, no, a pure idiot run this thing yeah. How can somebody budget out something for cost fifty million dollar? And one man, one man pay is that fifty million dollar? Rasta, no. As some know the government wicked, you know. Can you want know? You see that $200 million there? All them would have to do, you know. It just go down at Tivoli, find out how much people place damage, and just give each person a million dollars. Simple. And done, argument done. You know what people don't know that like give you $500,000 right now? Instead of go to all that is madness and a chat, 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 chat. When them know what them did do, them go down and go kill 70 odd people, shoot up the people they place, mash up the people they place, get them out of business and all them someday. You know how much people are Tivoli right now would have like whole lamp and all of 500,000 to come set up themselves. And una peer people when they talk about you don't have no money and you don't have to go to IMF because you don't have no money. Una pay people fifty million dollar for sit down for come find out something we don't know already. No, sir. May I tell you? Are you know something? Not now come out of it. When we say not now come out of it, I mean not now come out of the inquiry, you know. Not now come out of the fifty the, the two hundred the nearly two hundred million dollar where them supposed to pay. One man I get fifty million dollars. No, no, no Rasta, believe you me. No, I mean, how oh, oh, that possible? How oh, that possible? And that the fifty, the fifty million dollar don't include certain things, you know. I can't do a year. The fifteen million dollar don't include the cell phone with him. I will not prepared for him make call. And how far him come from, you know? I think a Barbie does him. I think a Barbie does him come from hotel accommodation. He must have in a hotel as long as him there. He not have no friend where he can sit down with and stay with. Them couldn't rent a big house and put him in a. And I know him when I get $50 million need, I know. And you have a woman there where have face with the people who get much or much. 30 odd million. Hey, <laughs> no. Believe you me. Jackass said earlier no level you know. It's not really that it really a level for true, you know. Cause that Col Columbus the things in the world is flat, the earth flat and that it's not flat. Fifty million dollar them budget for the old project and now it comes to two nearly two hundred million dollar. Uh, who are for them accountant, Rasta? Them need to come get some area accountants. Them need to get Sophia and them people. Them need to get well, well CEO named Debbie. Them need to get them people in up for them business because there's no. Them need to get some people who work on a craft market. Them need to get some people 
were in the arcade. Because it's them people in the arcade. Them couldn't go budget out, budget out something for cars fifty million dollars and end up as uh, as spend one hundred odd million dollars. That worse than the NHT thing, and I want the people them know that. I want the people them know say where the government bring off power we are so right now with this inquiry or so and the money where they work out. I want them know say it worse than the NHT debacle where them create. Is that like two hundred million dollar? I mean, me must not, me must not really, me must not have no sense. I mean, really, me, me, me must be really stupid. If me put on this thing and say, all right, I call into this, that, 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 this our cost me, that, that, that project our cost me ten thousand dollar. That money I forget that. That money I forget that. That money I forget that. So the budget our cost me ten thousand dollar. How the hell it turn around now say one somebody in the budget I'll get the whole with the whole budget. You can't, you can't explain that to me? No, you hear about it? Eh? No, no, you hear about it? The government for the inquiry where they have Pantivali Garden them say it's supposed to come up to 50 million dollars the project for pay this and pay that and pay that. And see there? Watch it. 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 See there? What? See there? See there? See there? As me I talk about it. See there? See there? Can you believe that? The project almost cost 50 million dollars. And one man. One man. That means that the accounts and you know when they are checking out. Know, they are supposed to check in. All of the possible. They must supposed to have in all miscellaneous, you know. As some of you know, people work, you know, say, all when we go up on tour, you know, we work out the tour money from here, so. And we said, this is going to cost that. The bus is going to cost that. The hotel, them, hotel, sometimes we don't pay the hotel, but we say, well, sometimes we don't have to work. You have to pay for the hotel then, because you have no promoter, we have to pay for that night then. So the hotel is going to cost that for the half night then. The per D for the half day then when we no work. So we now get no per D from promoter. Gas for the bus. Our budget in the thing. Now can you imagine you you budget a tour for cars fifty thousand dollars? And you end up here say the bass player alone and get fifty thousand. <laughs> Can you imagine you budget a tour for fifty thousand dollar? The whole tour is supposed to cost fifty thousand dollar. And your ears say, are the bass player alone supposed to get fifty thousand dollar? Them things that make man get rank. You know rank. You know rank like rank. Don't a Peter's late kind of rank. Rank like behind the courthouse on a town. Them hours a night, yeah. At that kind of rank there. Rank, man. Rank, rank, rank. We don't know. Jamaican people, wake up. Wake up. Believe you me, we have to wake up because that doesn't sound proper. That doesn't sound proper. That's worse than the NHT. May I tell you, it's worse than the NHT. They make the way them create. Worse. You know what say? We have been going through the archives of the cutting edge. And we have been bringing up some, some past tapes that we used to play where as signature the cutting edge. You know, these tapes over the 20 odd years have made cutting edge what cutting edge have been over the 20 odd years. So tonight we're going to feature a tape where it's the most played tape on the cutting edge. Tip. We play over this tip more than any other tip. But we know that sometimes when we play a tip, no how much time we play it, a whole lot of people never did hear it. And a whole lot of people stop you up on the road and say, Mota, you remember that tip the way you play now? Whatsoever, whatsoever. You can't play it back. 
we will give you your desire tonight. We're going to play over a tape where we have played. And I think that we have played this tape more than any other tape, but trust me, it's like the people them can't get enough of it. They want the year. We are asking the religious authorities please not to keep any prior breakfast this year. We have been monitoring these prior breakfasts and we have seen where every time them come out one after a week or two the crime rate escalate. Now the crime rate gone terribly and now since the year start much about 30 odd people dead in how much? Um, to the other one? 14. To the other 14 them say how much 30 odd people dead murdered in a 14 day. What kind of how, how will we live? Anyway now the prayer breakfast me, me, me not superstitious, you know. Me not a superstitious man, you know. Me deal with scientific facts. I have been monitoring this prayer breakfast over the years, and I realize that uh, every time them done a prayer breakfast, one or two weeks after, mm. murder those whoops. I mean, I thought I car accident either. I mean, I thought would raw murder. I am calling upon the authorities to postpone this prayer breakfast. It's not helping nothing. It's not helping nothing more than some big belly guys, diabetic guys, obese guys sit down and near bacon and egg and sausage and all them things and talk about them and pray to God for help the country. And them are pray, 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 and them not pray to the right God neither. That is why every time they come out, this thing get away. Them just sit down there, drink up them coffee, drink up them tea, them orange juice, and chat them chat, and then they go home back to them normal work. And then the crime was jump up because God not listening to them. God is not listening to them. Because it has helped nothing, 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 nothing. Practical work is what is necessary and needed. Practical work. Prayers right now is a thing of the past. Prayers is for the superstitious people. We say that non-apologetically. Prayers are for superstitious people who believe that there's something out there is listening to the prayer and will react to their prayer. People pray because them feel say something out there. Individual is listening to their individual prayer to do something about it. That is why when man why we lottery him pray. Him don't buy no ticket, but him pray for win the lottery. I don't know him going to win the lottery and him don't buy no ticket, but him pray for that. Because him have faith, but him don't work. And them see him once a faith without works is folly. So, we see people pray continuously in a Jamaica. And the more them, as a matter of fact, it's mostly, it's mostly poor people full up the church them at Sunday time, you know. And them pray for this and pray for that. But guess what? When them come out, them bars to the government this. And them bars to the government that. And if a little flood come, it wash their house. And them thank God say it's not them that get washed away. But God watch them house. Why would I want to watch them house? And you thank him for not washing with you. It's like a man in an accident. Now we say it has so much time. A man in an accident and him give a man a bad ride and the man drive go over the precipice and dead. Him say, Well, thank God say I know him. The next man dead, you know. Then him could all lose all of one foot and him say, well, thank God, God a man come and say, thank God, him not get, take your two foot. So I should have started, thank God, say, him not give me one foot. I don't understand that philosophy. For years now, I try to figure out that philosophy there and I need some counseling. We <laughs> need some counseling for that philosophy there. That man of prayer 
I really believe, say, really in them genuine heart of heart. Believe that there's something out there is listening to them. So when I want to go in a, a prayer breakfast, through the blood of Jesus, I really believe, say, the blood of Jesus is saving him from some atrocity. But I want to tell you, according to what I have seen over my life, there's nothing out there that is listening. Nothing. There's nothing out there that is listening. Because if it was so, if it was so, genuine people, loving people, kind people, honest people, wouldn't die like how we see them dead now. Something wrong with the equation. That good, honest, genuine people die. And the wicked prosper a whole heap of time. Look where I go on in the world right now. You have man a bum up people. You have man a tire and bump and little pick me. You have man a go to cities and wipe out whole city. You have presidents a send unman aeroplane to bomb up people and it bomb children and women. You have men sitting down in them high places creating weapons of all different sort who can create the most sophisticated weapon that will cause damage to human beings and leave plants and animals and buildings. You have people at the moment I am speaking now is conniving to kill somebody who did know. Who know or who she know. As I speak here, somebody out there is planning to kill somebody who them know for years though. It's a serious thing. A one must meditate for him life and see what him can do. It is up to you, the individual, to do what you can do to make life more meaningful and more purposeful for yourself and others around you. Whether you have a family or you have friends. I uh, hear some man that sing for real and all say him no one no friend and all them foolishness there. That is where it reach now. Man that sing for real and say him no one no friend. Some man that say him no one no woman. Because a woman is like shadow. Can you imagine a man that sit down and say him no one no woman? Him no one no man neither, you know. But him say him no one no woman. Like him is an island. You never hear the saying say no man is an island. You have woman out there say, well, me no one no man, man too wicked. So them try to go it alone. When you know, say, you have to have a balance. And people go to church to find God. Not realizing that God is not in the church. And a lot of people is leaving the church you now because... God knowing at the church. The church is one of the most destructive places right now for black people to stand up in a, every Sunday. That it gives them a warp sense of security. It makes them blissful in them ignorance. And the church is in cahoot with the politics of the country. Because most of the politics of the country come out of the church. Most schools in Jamaica started out of a church, a denomination. And we see the same people them grow up to be men and women and go to the university to get PhD, get all sorts of masters and come out and oppress the people them. 
most of these people were say in a big position right now. They were groomed and fashioned by a school that was started by a church. And let me tell you, say the values, they, they, we need to go back to Christian values. What is Christian values? What is the value of Christians that is different from Hindus or Buddhists or Rasikushanists? People want you to believe that if he's not a Christian, you do have no values. You do have no morals. Even atheists have morals. But people say if you don't believe in the Christian God, he's doomed. But when I look upon evil in a Jamaica, I don't have to go far if you say who is suffering in Jamaica? Who is suffering in Jamaica? Who for house wash for most of the time? Who for house a bun down most of the time? And them a ball pan TV. Who can't carry them picnic at school most of the time? Who? Poor people. Poor black people. Who go to church every Sunday. Sit down on the veranda and read them Bible. And try instilling at them children the teachings of the Bible. And when anything happens to them, instead of them go to the church, them go to the Obia man to fix them problem. And then them pick me out there. Can't go to school. Grow up. And become destructive. Me don't know if me no have no sense. But me see the same people them who go church who believe in a Jesus turn accountants and put 50 million dollars on the table and said this must cost 50 million dollars and it is now costing 100 odd million dollars and one man one of the man them for him go come up to the wall hey I wonder if a man understand where I go on one man ago get where all of the people them in the group supposed to get. Not to mention the next man we get 50 million dollars to. And the next one I get 40 million. And the next one I get 30 million. Then Jamaican people only not see something wrong with that. Only really not see nothing wrong with that. Only just go on business as usual like NHD. All right. Them say them this and that and that. Now we hear them talk about buy the, 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 the copyright to the... Uh, hey. MPV has take black people for idiots, you know, I guess what? Most of we are going like we are idiots for true. The final phase of the ultimate mission has now been... You know, we are talking about the church and how the church manipulate the minds of the people, them. I know even the politicians, them, get manipulated by the church. And how most of the school, them, in a Jamaica, the well established school, them, is started by a church. And we always give praises to the church to do all these wonderful things in the society you know the church starts schools you know christian values and all these things and if you check out 99.99 of these people they will tell you that they give credence to christian values but these people who give credence to christian values what have they done to satisfy this value that them give it to. And when we look at the state of Jamaica today, when we look at the state of Jamaica today, and make we say, when we look at the state of the Western world, when we look at the state of the Western world today, and make we even go further than the Western world too, when we look at the state of religion, and see what religion is doing to the minds of people. Religion make good people do evil things. Religion make good people do evil things. And when we see what them use religion to do, 
to millions of African people brought from them own land and taken across that sea, the Atlantic Ocean, and taken into a foreign land and was whipped and lashed and all of them feelings of joy and happiness get beaten out of them and they become hardened so hard and then they put this in the name of the blood of and you can't tell black people nothing you can't tell black people nothing when come on to the blood because all the people are saying about wash in the blood of the lamb figuratively speaking that even the Roman Catholic Church when them put the Eucharist in their mouth them say it become the flesh of Jesus and when them drink the wine they say it become the blood of Jesus literally how the hell sensible people how the hell people with their masters people with them PhD can believe such rubbish and stupidness and if they make the masters and the PhD them believe that and accept as a reality what you think them doing to you you know them illusion and them corruption what has it done to better the life of African people internationally and as a nation all these religious belief system I will see a rasta in graph some of them little thinking there in a them own way of life and I push it out upon the people them you hear rasta come with the same little antagonistic fundamentalist craziness Where do we go from here? Because if you keep doing the same thing the same way all the while, you go and get the same result. And that is what is happening. We're trying to get a different result from doing the same thing all the while. What has it benefited us after 500 years, 400 years, after 2,000 years? What has it done to mankind and in heart? What has it done to mankind's spirit? Where's the connection between human nature and the birds and the flowers and the bees and the trees and the animals? What has it done to his spirit that when you look on a man now, you're afraid of him more than all. You're afraid of a dog. Can you imagine that? You see man approach you. And you see a dog approach you. And you're afraid of the man more than all. You're afraid of the dog. How did we get to that thinking, that stage of underdevelopment? So, we're saying that to say this. That one of the teams that we play, well, I am saying that we have played this team more than any other team. Is a team about a nun named Sister Charlotte. For those of you who have never heard it before, you're going to hear it tonight. You're going to hear the journey of this young lady trying to find Jesus in the Roman Catholic Church. And what she had to go through and persevere and even have to escape out of the decadent life that she didn't believe was there in the church. And how much of us realize that? Sometimes we realize when it's too late that we start the same very thing that we find decadent, we start to preach it. Some people go find decadence, you know, and start preaching decadence, said we, you know. They will not see that not the music, man. We see that not the music, you know. We see that not the music. Man say, 
he might be boss and the only way he can boss is to say certain things and do certain things. You see the girl them now. You don't have to go and go go club again, you know. All you have to do is go out and dance all show and look on the stage. All them need is a pole on the stage. Because some of them dance are there. How them dress? I like what go-go girl dress. It don't no, no make no difference. And them are going to see them. We are all up them crutches and are wild. I mean, me, me I tell you, Rasta. I will accept these things as a normal thing. We accept that our young children must do what they want to do because this is the age of democracy and freedom. That's why it named dumb. Freedom. Because when you see a little daughter, I mean, what kind of fun? I mean, me nah, me nah, me nah, one of them fundamentalists there where one come tell a little daughter, and I say, go, go take off that, and go, this, and this, and that. No, me nah, not that, you know. But when you see a, a sister, a, 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 entertain people, on stage, but she's the center of attraction. And when you look on her, she's like one of them go-go girls. Yes, but oh, my sister reached this all. Oh, my sister reached this all. And this is a normal thing. A normal thing. So, we want to present to you a nun named Sister Charlotte very true story. Believe it or not, it really did happen. <laughs> All right, here goes. This was an exceedingly graphic and gripping tape. It's a testimony of an ex-nun by the name of Sister Charlotte, who disappeared approximately two years after having given this testimony. If you have young children with you, you may wish to screen this tape and listen to it yourself before determining whether you want your child to hear the material that is on it. We're people. I couldn't be a Christian if I still had bitterness in my heart. God delivered me from all bitterness and strife and delivered me out of all of that one day and made himself real to me in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when I give this testimony, I'm giving it because after God saved me, he delivered me out of the convent and out of bondage and darkness. The Lord laid the burden upon my heart to give this testimony that others might know what cloistered convents are. And so as you listen carefully this afternoon, I trust I will not say one thing that will leave any feeling in your heart whatsoever that I don't carry a burden for the Roman Catholic people. I don't like the things they do. I don't agree with the things that they teach. But I covet their soul for Jesus. I'm interested in their souls. I believe Jesus went to Calvary. He died that you and I might know him. And their souls are just as precious as your soul and my soul. So I'm interested. First of all, as we slip into this testimony, having been born in Roman Catholicism, not knowing anything else, not knowing the word of God, because we didn't have a Bible in our home, we had never heard anything about this wonderful plan of salvation. And so naturally, I grew up in that Roman Catholic home as a child, knowing only the catechism, knowing only the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. And because I loved the Lord, and because I wanted to do something for Him, I wanted to give Him my life, I didn't know of any other way for a Roman Catholic girl to give her life to God other than entering a convent. And through going to the confessional box where, naturally, I'm under the influence of my father confessor, the Roman Catholic priest, his influence over my life, one day I made up my mind, through his influence and one of my teachers in the parochial school, that I wanted to be a little sister. At that time I thought of being a sister of the open order. But as I went on into this, up until the time I took my white veil, 16 and a half years of age, uh, everything was beautiful. I really didn't have any fear in my heart whatsoever. Everything was taught to me was seemingly along the line that I had been taught in the church before I entered a convent. And so one day after having been, uh, after making up my mind to enter a convent, 
I remember that particular day, two of the sisters came home with me from school. They were my teachers. And when we arrived at my father's home uh, that afternoon, uh, our father confessor was in the home uh, likewise. I often say when I was a little girl, children were seen and not heard. You didn't talk when you was a child, at least you didn't in my family, in my home, unless you were spoken to. And I remember I listened to them carry on a conversation, and then I moved over close enough to my father to ask him if I could say something. And that was a bit out of the ordinary, and he permitted me to talk, and I said, Dad, I want to go into a convent. And I'll tell you, that priest took it up quickly. They had already been influencing me. And my father broke down and began to cry, not because he's sad, but he's very happy. My mother came over and took me in her arms, and she too wept tears. She was very happy. Those were not tears of sadness, because I think her little girl was giving her life to the convent to pray for lost humanity. And naturally, my family were very thrilled about it, and I was too. But anyway, I didn't go for about a year after that, and then the time come when I got myself ready, and my mother prepared things for me, and... So I entered the convent. They took me, and we didn't have a place close enough to my father and mother's home, so I think they took me around a thousand miles away from home, where I entered a convent boarding school. I liked about three months being 13 years of age, just a little girl. I look back on it now and think, my, homesick, I was so homesick. Why, my mother and daddy, they stayed three days with me, and when they left, I became so homesick naturally. Why shouldn't I? Just a baby away from home. And when I was a little girl, you know, I had never spent a night away from my mother. And I surely had never gone any place without my family. I was very lonely and very homesick. But I'll never forget after Dad and Mother told me goodbye. And I knew they were traveling a long distance away from me. And I had never realized in my heart I'll never see them again. Naturally, I hadn't planned it like that because I planned to be a sister of the open order. But if you listen carefully uh, to this portion of the testimony, then you'll understand just why I'm saying some of the things that I say. Now, oftentimes we say the priest selects his material through the confessional box. Because at seven years of age, I went to confessional. Seven years of age, I would always, when I come into the church, first I'd slip over at the feet of the crucifix, uh, uh, rather the Virgin Mary, and then over at the feet of the crucifix, and I'd ask the Virgin Mary to help me make a good confession. Because uh, I was a child and my heart was honest, and I knew the priest had taught us to always make a good confession, keep nothing back, tell everything if I expected absolution from any sin that I might have committed. And so I would ask the Virgin Mary to help me make a good confession. And I would ask them, the, uh, the uh, uh, Jesus to help me make a good confession. And you know, I'll assure you, uh, when I, after I lived in the convent for a short period of time, now I had to go on with my schooling. I just finished the eighth grade. And they promised me to give me a high school education, some college uh, education. But I didn't get much college. I got mostly just high school training. And they gave that to me all right. I took it under some terrible difficulties and strains and all of that. It was rather difficult. But they gave it to me, for which I appreciate very, very much. But I'll assure you, after they put me through the crucial training that we must go through to become uh, just a little novitiate entering a convent, uh, the training is really, it's outstanding as far as the nun is concerned, and you know what it's all about after you've been in there for a little while. So now I've entered the convent, and for just a few minutes we want to tell you just a little bit how we live, what we eat, how we sleep. That'll, uh, if I take you into the convent and tell you those things, you'll understand a little bit more about my testimony. Uh, first, uh, as I entered the convent as a small child, I went on to school, but they were I was being trained. But the day came, uh, possibly I was 14 and a half, when the Mother Spirit began to tell me about the white veil. And I didn't know too much about it, uh, but taking the white veil, they told me that I would become the spy for the bride of Jesus Christ. There would be a ceremony, and I would be dressed in a wedding garment. And uh, on this particular morning, uh, they told me at 9 o'clock, uh, they would dress me up in a wedding garment. Now, are you wondering uh, where that come from and how they get the wedding clothes for the little nuns? The mother superior sits down and writes a letter to my father and tells him how much money she wants. And then, um, whatever she asks, my father sends it, and she, the little buying sister, goes out and buys uh, the material, and the uh, uh, wedding gown is made by the nuns of the cloister. I'm still open order now. And, of course, whatever she asks, now you say, did they spend all the money for the wedding gown? Well, of course, we don't know these things in the very beginning of our testimony, but after we live in a convent for a little while, we learn to know they could ask my father for $100, and he'd send it. And uh, oh, not, they wouldn't 
use maybe a third of that for the wedding garment, uh, but they would keep the rest of it. My father would never know the difference, neither did I, until I lived in the convent for a period of time, and I had to make some of the wedding clothes, and then I knew the value of them and what they cost, and I knew of the money that came in because I was one of the older nuns. Well, all right, the time came, of course, when I walked down that aisle and I was dressed in a wedding garment. Now, you know, in the um, convent, I used to walk the 14 stations of the cross, the 14 steps that Jesus carried the cross to Calvary. But after I had made up my mind to take the white veil, never again did I walk. I wanted to be worthy. I wanted to be holy enough to become the spouse of the bride of Jesus Christ. And so I would get out on my knees and crawl the 14 stations. It's quite a distance. But I crawled them every Friday morning. I felt it would make me holy. I felt it would draw me closer to God. It would make me worthy of the step that I was going to take. And that's what I wanted more than anything in the world. I would like to impress on your hearts every little girl that enters the convent that I know anything about. That child has a desire to live for God. That child has a desire to give her heart, mind, and soul to God. Now, many, many people make this remark, and we hear it from uh, various uh, types of folk who say only bad women go into convents. That isn't true. There are movie stars who go into convents, and they've lived out in the world. No doubt they are sinners and all of that. But they go in when they're women. They know what they're doing. And they go in only because the Roman Catholic Church is going to receive not only thousands, but yeah, it'll run up into the millions of dollars. And they don't mind who they take in if they can get a lot of money out of that individual. But the ordinary little girl that goes in as a child, she's just a child, and she goes in there with a heart and mind and soul just as clean as any child could be. I, I say that because sometimes we hear a lot of things that are really not true. Now, after we become the spouse of Jesus Christ, I want you to listen carefully to this, and then you can follow me into the rest of the testimony. We are now looked upon as married women. We are looked upon as married women. We are the spouse or the bride of Jesus Christ. Now, the priest teaches every little girl that will take the white veil, they'll become the bride of Christ. He teaches her to believe that her family will be saved. It doesn't make any difference how many banks they rob, how many stores they rob. It doesn't make any difference how they drink and smoke and carouse and live out in, in this sinful world and do all the things that sinners do. It doesn't make a bit of difference. Still, our family will be saved if we continue to live in the convent and give our lives to the convent or to the church. Uh, we can rest assured that every member of our immediate family will be saved. And you know there are many little children that are influenced and enticed to go into convents because we realize it is a salvation for our families. And sometimes, even Roman Catholic families, the children grow up and leave the Roman Catholic Church and go out into the deepest of sin. And so every little girl that enters a convent is hoping by her sacrificing so much, home and loved ones, mother and daddy, everything that a child loves, her family will be saved regardless of what sins they commit. And of course we're children and our minds are immature and we don't know any better. And it's so easy to instill things like this into the hearts and minds of little children. And the priest is a really, he's really good at it. And of course, we look upon our priest, our father confessor. I looked upon him as God. He's the only God I knew anything about. And to me, he was infallible. I didn't think he could sin. I didn't think that he would lie. I didn't think that he ever made a mistake. I looked upon him as the holiest of holy because I didn't know a God, but I did know the Roman Catholic priest. And to me, I, I, I looked to him uh, for everything that I asked uh, of any of God, so to speak. I believe the priest could give it to me. And so the day comes when all of us. Now, as we're going in, I want you to listen carefully. After taking the white veil, things are beautiful. I'm 16 and a half years of age. Everyone's good to me. And uh, I'm living in the convent, and I haven't seen anything yet. Because no little girl, we're not subject to a Roman Catholic priest until we're 21 years of age. And as we give you this next vow, then you'll understand that we don't know about this. This is kept from the little sisters until we've taken her black veil. And then it's too late. I, I don't carry the keys to those double doors. And there's no way for me to come out. The priest will uh, tell all over the whole United States and other countries that sisters or nuns, rather, can walk out of convents when they want to. I spent 22 years there. I did everything there was to do to get out. I've carried tablespoons with me into the dungeons and tried to dig down into that dirt because there's no floors in those places. But I never yet found myself digging far enough to get out of a convent with a tablespoon, and that's about the only instrument. Because when we're using the spade, and we do have to do hard, heavy work, when we use a spade, we're being guarded, we're being watched uh, by two older nuns, and they're going to report on us, and not a 
assure you, you're not going to try to dig out with a spade, and you wouldn't get very far anyway, because they built, made those convents or built those convents, so little nuns cannot escape. That was their purpose in building them as they build them. And there's no way for us to get out unless God makes a way, but I believe God's making a way for numbers of little girls after they come out of the convents. All right, now when the time comes, I, I think I was 18 when the mother began talking to me. Now, I planned to come out, see, after my wife bail. I wanted to be a little nursing sister in the Roman church. But the mother superior, I suppose she was watching my life. I suppose she realized I had much endurance. I had a strong body. And I believe the woman was watching me because one day she asked me to come into her office and she began to tell me, Charlotte, you have a strong body. And she said, I believe you have uh, the uh, possibilities of making a good nun, a cloister nun. I believe you're the type that would be willing to give up home, give up mother and daddy, give up everything you love out in the world, and the world, so to speak, and hide yourself away behind convent doors. Because I believe you're the kind who would hide back there and be willing to sacrifice and live in crucial poverty that you might pray for lost humanity. She said, I believe you're the kind to be willing to suffer because we are taught to believe as nuns that we, as we suffer, our loved ones and your loved ones that are already in a priest purgatory will be delivered from purgatory sooner because of our suffering. She knew I was willing to suffer. I didn't murmur. I didn't complain. She knew all of that and she's watching my life and that's the reason she began to tell me about the black veil. And then of course, you know, I didn't know too much about a cloistered nun. I, I didn't know their life. I didn't know how they live. I didn't know what they'd done. But you know, this woman proceeded to tell me. Now we hear a lot of people uh, try to tell me in the various places that we travel and go. I hear a lot of Roman Catholics try to tell me I've been in so many cloisters, I know all about them. But you know, yeah, a Roman Catholic can lie to you, and they don't have to go to confession and tell the priest about the lie that they told, because they're lying to protect their faith. And they can tell any lie they want to to protect their faith and never go to the confessional box and tell the priest about it. They can do more than that. They can steal up to $40, and they don't have to tell the priest about it. They don't have to say one word about it in the confessional box. They are taught that. Every Roman Catholic knows it, and every Roman Catholic, you'd be horrified to know how many of them steal up to that amount. And many of them lie. We've dealt with them. I've dealt with hundreds and hundreds of them. I've seen good many of them fall into the altar and cry out to God to save them. And you know, before they're saved, they look into my face and hold my hand and lie to me. But after God gets a hold of their heart, then they want to make right what they've told me because they realize they've lied about it. But as long as they're Roman Catholic, they're permitted to lie. And it's the saddest thing. And uh, you can't expect them to know God because God doesn't kind of does not condone sin. I don't care who you are. I don't believe God condones sin. And I don't believe he's going to condone it to the Roman Catholic people, even though they're being misled and they're being blinded and led in the ways that's going to lead them into a uh, uh, devil's hell. I believe that with all of my heart, because uh, I, I've lived in a convent and know something about how those people live and what they do. Now the day comes. She told me, Charlotte, you'll have to be willing to spill your blood as Jesus shed his upon Calvary. She said, you'll have to be willing to do penance, heavy penance. She said, you'll have to be willing to live in crucial poverty. Now, already I'm, I'm living in a bit of poverty, but I thought that was going to make me holy and draw me closer to God, and it would make me a better nun, and so I'm willing uh, to live in that poverty. And then on this particular morning, she told me what I would be wearing. She said, you'll spend nine hours in a casket, and she explained a number of things to me. That's the most I knew about it, and I didn't find that out until I'd taken my white veil. And so on this particular morning, I'm 21 years of age, but 60 days previous to my being 21 years of age, I'm going to sign some some papers that they place in front of me, and those papers are this. I'm going to sign away every bit of inheritance that I might have received from my family after their death. Of course, I signed that over to the Roman Catholic Church, and uh, oftentimes uh, I say the Roman Catholic priests are enticing girls, uh, not only their background, and not only their strong bodies, their strong minds and strong wills, but he's enticing girls where mothers and fathers have much property, and they are comfortably fixed with the material things of this life. Why? Because when that child enters the convent, they're going to get a portion of her money, of her father's money. And I often say, yeah, even salvation in the Roman Catholic Church is going to cost you plenty of money, more than you know anything about. And so they don't mind commercializing off of that child and the inheritance that would have come to her. And so on this particular morning, I, I told the mother... The holidays are over, but Digicel wants to give you a bazooka. You are listening to Muta Baruka. They're strong bodies, they're strong minds and strong wheels, but he's enticing girls where mothers and fathers have much property, and they are 
comfort to be fixed with the material things of this life. Why? Because when that child enters the convent, they're going to get a portion of her money, of her father's money. And I often say, yeah, even salvation in the Roman Catholic Church is going to cost you plenty of money, more than you know anything about. And so they don't mind commercializing off of that child and the inheritance that would have come to her. And so on this particular morning, I told the Mother Spirit, give me a little while to think it over. She didn't make me do it. No one did. But I thought it over for a couple of years. And then one day I told her, I think I'm going to hide away behind the convent doors because I believed I could give more time to God. I could pray more and more. I, I maybe would be uh, in a position where I could inflict more pain upon my body because we are taught to believe that God smiles down out of heaven as we do penance, whatever the suffering might be. And I didn't know any better because I often say, if you could only look into the hearts of little nuns, uh, yeah, if you are a Christian, you would immediately uh, cry out before God uh, in behalf of those little girls because to me we are heathens. It doesn't make any difference the amount of education we may have. We are still heathens. We know nothing about this lovely Christ, nothing about the plan of salvation, and we're living as hermits in the convent. And so on um, this particular morning, I come walking down an aisle again, a same minute to that, and may I say, uh, the what, morning before, I, I can't go into it too deep because I never would be able to cover enough of it so you could understand it, but this morning I'm walking down that aisle, but I don't have a wedding garment on. I have a funeral shroud. It's made of dark red velvet, and it's way down to the floor. And I'm walking down that aisle. Now I know what I'm going to do. The casket is all made, ready made by the nuns of the cloister. Very rough boards and it's sitting right out here. And I know when I come down there that I'll step in that casket and lay my body down. And I'm going to spend nine hours in there. And two little nuns will come and cover me up with a, wee, a heavy black cloth we call, call a heavy drape mortel. And you know it's so heavily incensed that I feel like I'll smother to death. And I have to stay there. Now I know when I come out of uh, of that casket, I'll never leave the convent again. I know I'll never see my mother and father again. I'll never go home again. I'll always live behind convent doors, and when I die, my body will be buried there. They took so I knew it even before I'd done it. It's a great price to pay then to find out that convents are not religious orders as we were taught and as we were trained. It's quite a disappointment to a young girl that's given her life to God and willing to give up so much and sacrifice so much. I'll assure you it was a disappointment. And so after uh, I spent those... Now you say, what do you do while you lay in that casket? What do you think I did? I spilled every tear in my body. I remembered every lovely thing my mother done for me. I remembered her voice. I remember the gathering around the table. I remember the times when she would pray with us. I remember the things that she said to me. I remember what a marvelous cook she was. Everything as a little girl growing up in that home, I remembered it, laying in that casket, knowing I'll never hear her voice again. I'll never see her face again. I'll never put my feet under her table again, enjoy her good cooking. I knew all that. And so maybe for four hours I spilled all the tears in my body because it was so hard. And I knew I'd get homesick. I knew I'd want to see her someday. But I gave it all up. What for? For the love of God, I thought I didn't know any better. And I'll assure you, those were nine long hours. And then I seemingly got a hold of myself and I thought, Dear Charlotte, now you're going to make the best Carmelite nun because everything I've ever done, even that I'm out of the comment, I do give my best. I try to give everything that I have in regardless what I might do. And so I did in the convent. I gave the best that I have. And I want to be the best nun that I could possibly be. And the Mother Superior knew that. And don't worry, the priest knew all about it too. Now I realize after I walk out of that casket or to come out of it, they're going to take me like this. Over here and right back here is a room. We call it the Mother Superior's room. Now, I've never been in that particular room, so I don't know what she has in there. But you know, when I walk in there this time, the Mother Superior sits me down in a straight back, hard bottom chair. And immediately then I'm going to take three vow vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And you know, as I take those vows, uh, she opens a little place in the lobe of my ear and takes out a portion of blood because I must sign every vow in my own blood. And after that uh, happens, uh, then I'm going to take the vow of poverty. Now when I sign that vow, I sign it thus, and I'm willing to live in crucial poverty, the balance of my life, as long as I live. And what that poverty is like, of course, we don't know. And then my next vow, I'm going to vow of chastity. And you know this vow, of course, you know what it means. I'm taught to believe that I'm married to Jesus Christ. I'm his bride. 
I'll always remain a virgin. I'll never legally marry again in this world because I have become the spouse of the bride of Jesus Christ. After the bishop married uh, me to Christ, he placed the ring on my finger, and that meant I'm sealed to Christ. I'm married to him, and I accepted it because I didn't know any better. And now here I am, taking a vow that I would always remain a virgin because I'm the bride of Christ. And I want you to listen carefully. And then, of course, my last vow of obedience. Now, when we sign that vow, I'll assure you already, I know what obedience means. I'm living in a convent. And there they demand absolute obedience. You don't get by with anything, not even for two minutes. I mean, you don't get by with it. You have to realize what obedience means, and they demand it, and you learn to know it. And you're much wiser as well. the more quickly you learn it and you obey it, and you give them absolute obedience. All right, now, what does it mean to assign vows like this? Let me tell you this. It means more than you folk will ever know, because uh, most people that I know anything about, they know very little about obedience. Oh, in a sense, yes, but you'll never know what a little nun knows about obedience. I'll assure you that one thing, unless you live in the convent. All right, that particular uh, uh, vow, when I signed it into my own blood, it, it done something to me, because after I've signed those vows, do you realize that I've signed away everything I have, my human rights? I have become a mechanical human being now. I can't sit down until they tell me to. I don't dare to get up until they tell me to. I can't lie down until they tell me to, and neither do I dare to get up. I cannot eat until they tell me to. I, I, and what I see, I don't see. What I hear, I don't hear. What I feel, I don't feel. I've become a mechanical human being, but you're not aware of that until you have signed all these vows. Then you realize, here I am, a mechanical human being. And, of course, I belong to Rome now. I'll assure you that right now. All right, we become, after this particular vows, we become forgotten women of the convent. In just a short while, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Now, immediately after I've taken those vows, then the mother superior is going to give me, take away from me my name, and give me the name of a patron saint. And she teaches me to believe that whatever happens to me in the convent, I can pray to that patron saint, and she will intercede and get my prayers through to God, because I'm not holy enough to stand in the presence of God. It isn't wonder the dear little nuns can never get close enough to God. We've always been taught that we'll never be holy enough to stand in his presence, and we always have to go through somebody else in order to get a prayer through to God, and we believe it because we don't know any better, and so now all identification of who Charlotte was is going to be put away, it'll be taken away from me, and if you would knew me and would come to the convent and call for my family name, they'd tell you there isn't such a person as that, I don't exist, even though I'm right there, because I'm writing under another name, now the mother superior is going to cut every bit of hair off of my head, and when she cuts it with a scissor, she puts the clippers on it. And I mean, there's nothing left. I just don't have one speck of hair left on my head. And of course, if you could be a nun, you would understand. The heavy headgear that we have to wear, it would be so cumbersome to have hair and so cumbersome to take care of it. We don't have any ways of taking care of it in the convent. There are no combs in the convent. And so you can imagine how hot it would be for us to take care of a head of hair. It's not necessary that we have a comb after they finish with us. All right, now, this is my black veil. These are my perpetual vows, we'll call them. I'm there, and I'm going to stay there. Now, you know, up until this time, I received a letter once a month from my family, and I wrote a letter out of the convent once a month to my family. Even though when I'd write that letter, uh, I'd no doubt they marked out a lot of it, because when I would receive a letter from my family, there was so much of it blacked out until there was no sense to the letter. And, oh, I'd weep over those black marks. I was wondering what my mother was trying to say to me. Don't worry, you'll never get to know what she wanted to say to you, because they have black it out. And so if you break your hearts many, many times, and you're lonely anyway, because uh, you have no friends in the convent, I'll assure you, even though there was 180 on my particular wing, not one of those nuns were my friend, and neither was I a friend to them, because we are not allowed to be friends in the convent. We are all policemen or detectives watching each other. That's so we'll tell. And the little nun that finds something to tell on the other nuns, she stands in good favor with the mother superior. And then the mother teaches that nun to believe. When she stands in good favor with the mother superior, she's standing in good favor with God. And so that little nun, of course, will want that and she'll tell a lot of things maybe that are not even true on the other little nun. All right, now after all of this has transpired and all of this has happened, everything I have is gone. I've sold my soul for a mess of theological pottage because not only are we destroyed in our bodies, many of us in our minds, and many of us, if we die in the convent, we've lost our soul. And so it's a serious thing. And I, 
I, I surely covet your prayers for little nuns behind cloistered convent doors. They'll never hear this gospel. They'll never know the Christ that you folk uh, know today. Uh, today. You'll never, they'll never pray to him as you people pray to him. They'll never feel his blessings as you people feel them. And so put them on your heart and pray for them. They surely need much prayer. All right, now, uh, as I walk into that room and all of this is transpiring. Now, bless your hearts, I don't know what's going to be in the next room. After this has transpired and I've taken the vows that I will always remain a virgin, uh, I'll never legally marry in this world because I'm the spouse of Christ. And then after this, the Mother Superior leads me out into another room, or rather she opens the door, and I'm to be sent into that room. And when I walk out in that room, I see something I have never seen before. I see a Roman Catholic priest dressed in a holy habit, and he walks over to me and locks his arm in my arm, which he had never done in the first part of my convent life. I never had a priest to insult me in any way. I never had one other to be even unkind to me in the first part of my convent experience. But here he is now, and of course I didn't understand what it was all about. And I didn't know what in the world the man really expected of me. And you know, I pulled from him because I felt highly insulted. And I pulled from him and I said, shame on you. And it made him very angry for a minute. He said, uh, immediately, the mother superior must have heard my voice because she came out immediately. And she said, oh, and they called me by my church name. She said, after you've been in the convent a little while, you won't feel this way. The rest of us felt the same way you do. And you know, the priest body is sanctified. And therefore, it is not a sin for us to give of the priest our bodies. In other words, they teach every little nun this. As the Holy Ghost placed the germ in Mary's womb, and Jesus Christ was born, so the priest is the Holy Ghost, and therefore it isn't a sin for us to bear his children. And let me tell you, that's what they come to the convent for. No other purpose in all of this world do priests come into the convent but to rob those precious little girls of their virtue. And I'll assure you, we'll be telling you a little later in the testimony just what they really do after they come in under those particular uh, 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 but may I say, now every bridge has been burned out from under me. There's no way back. I can't get out of the convent even though I pled. Oh, how I pled with that priest. Send for my father. I want to go home. I don't want to go any farther. And let me tell you, that's when you stand alone and you don't know who to turn to, and you're a victim of circumstances, and you'll live in the convent because there is no other way to get out of the convent. And I'll assure you, I stayed in the convent until God made a way for me to come out. And so after all of this, now my mail will stop. I'll never receive another bit of mail from my family. Never another letter. I belong to the Pope. I belong to Rome. And then after all of this, the Mother Superior, after taking these particular vows, and the priest has invited me to go... Uh, uh, to the bridal chamber, you say, did you go? No, definitely not. I didn't enter the convent to be a bad woman. It would have been much easier to have stayed out of the convent to be a bad woman. You wouldn't go into the convent and live uh, in the poverty we live in and to suffer as we suffer to be a bad woman. No girl would do that. And it would have been much easier to stay out of the convent if I wanted to be a bad woman. But I went there to give my life and heart to, uh, to God. And that was the only purpose I had in going there. And here this priest is. And of course I didn't go to the bridal chamber with him. I had a strong body then. One of us would have been wounded because I would have fought until the last drop of blood. And you know, it made them very, very angry, I'll assure you. But he, I didn't go to the bridal chamber with him. But now I'm going to have to go to penance the next morning. And of course this will be a uh, heavier penance because of what I've done already. And when the Mother Superior says we're going to do penance the next morning, uh, I'm going to be initiated as a Carmelite nun. And I remember when she walked me down into that particular place, it was a dark room. I remember I lived above on the first floor until my black veil. After the black veil, they take me one story under the ground. And I lived from there on until God delivered me under the ground. I didn't live in the top part of this uh, buildings at all. But you know, as we walked into this room, it's dark and it's very cold. And when we walked in, we came from back there somewhere. We come walking toward the front, and I walked along beside the Mother Superior. And when I got near the front, I saw those little candles burning. Anywhere in the convent, you'll find the seven candles burning. And when I came a little closer, I saw the candles, but I couldn't see anything else. And I wondered, what's she going to do to me? That's the thing in our hearts, and we can't get away from it because we have fear. And when I come a little closer, I saw uh, something lying on a board there. And you know, when I came real close, then I realized, here's a little nun lying on that board. I'll call it a cooling board because it was that. 
and uh, just as long as her body. And there she was, and when I could see where the candles flickered down on her face, I realized that child is dead. And oh, I wanted so much to say, how did she die? Why is she here? How long do you keep her here? But you remember, I signed away every human right. And so I can't say one word, but I stood looking. Then the mother said, a superior, a superior said, you stand vigil over this dead body for one hour. And at the end of the hour, a little bell is tapped and another nun will come to relieve me. And may I say, I was advised every so many minutes, I have to walk out in the front of that little body and sprinkle holy water and ashes over the body and say, peace be unto you. And I did exactly what they told me to do. Oh, it was a terrible feeling. I'm not afraid of the dead. It's the life people we have to be very cautious about. And I wasn't afraid of that little dead nun, but oh, my heart ached for. And, uh, you know, after the bell tapped and I realized my hour's gone, the nun who comes to relieve us comes back here somewhere. And she, of course, we walk on our tiptoes, no noise is made in the convent, and when they don't speak, they just touch you. And of course, by being down there with that little dead nun, and I was full of fear, when that girl laid a hand on my shoulder, I let out a scream, a horrible scream, from fear, just fear. And you know, I, did, I, I didn't mean to do it. I didn't break that rule on purpose, but I was scared. And immediately, uh, of course, I had to come before the mother superior, and that's when I le first learned to know, one of the first times, about a dungeon. They didn't tell me there were dungeons in the convent, and she put me in such a dirty, dark place with no floor in it for three days and nights, and I didn't get any food and any water. And I'll assure you, I didn't scream anymore. I tried so hard not to break the rules of screaming because there is a dungeon, and I know they'll put you in it. And let me tell you right now, it's not a nice place to be. After you've been in one of those places, you'll know what it feels like. All right, now, I say this uh, before I go any farther, that popery is a masterpiece of Satan. I said it's a masterpiece of Satan with its lying wonders and his traditions and his deception. It's a terrible thing when you know about it. And so uh, my, uh, as I come down into this room and she took me, uh, let me look at this little girl and that particular, if we call it a penis, is over. Now the very next morning, she said again to me, Charlotte, you're going to do penis. Not the next morning, it was three days after, because I spent three days and nights in the dungeon. And the next, uh, or fourth, fifth morning, whichever it was, she said, you're going to do penis. She took me down into another room, not the same room. And when we come I'm walking down this time, I could see that big piece of wood, but I didn't know what it was. And when I came a little closer, there was a cross. It was made of heavy timber. I, I might say it was maybe eight or ten feet high. Very heavy. And that cross was sitting on an incline like that. And she had me walk over here at the base of the cross. And she said, now strip your clothes off. And I took my clothes off. And then she made me down to my waistline. Then she made me drape my uh, body over the foot of that cross. And she pulled my hands underneath and bound them to my feet. Uh, uh, and then, you know, that's where I'm going to spill my blood. And she had not told me how, and neither could I ask. Uh, how I would spill it. And she gave two little nuns that came with her a flagellation whip. It's, uh, I might call it a bamboo pole. It's about this long. It's about that big around. And it has six straps on it about this long. And on the end of either of those straps, there's a cross piece of sharp metal. And those little nuns, uh, either was given one of these whips. And they stood on either side of the cross. Now, at the same time, those girls began whipping my body. And I mean, when that uh, metal hit my body, it would break the hide, of course. It was cut into the flesh, and I spilled blood, and it was running down to the floor. That's my flagellation whip, uh, whipping. That is where I spill my blood, as Jesus shed his upon Calvary. And of course, I'm human. It wounded. It hurt. It was very painful. After the whipping is over, they don't bathe my body. They put my clothing back up on my body, and I have to go the rest of the day. When the night comes, and I stand in front of my cell there, I after we have to stand there to undress with our backs to each other, and then when I went in, oh, Oh, I couldn't sleep that night. I, I just wasn't a bit sleepy because I couldn't take off all my clothes. They had dried in those wounds, and it was terrible. I didn't take them off for several nights. And I'll assure you, when I came before my food, I didn't want my cup of black coffee. In the morning, we got a cup of black coffee. They serve it a tin cup, and we could have no milk or no sugar of any type in it. And we have one slice of bread. That's made by the nuns of the cloister. They weigh it. It weighs four ounces. That's all I get for breakfast. And then, of course, in the evening, I got a bowl of soup, and that's fresh vegetables cooked together. Gather. There's no seasoning in the soup whatsoever. And a half a slice of bread, and three times a week they give me a half a glass of skim milk. That consists of my food 365 days in the year. 
and I began losing weight very rapidly, I'll assure you, because I didn't have enough food to eat. I don't know the day that I went to bed without a hungry stomach. Sometimes it would be so hungry, I couldn't sleep. The pain was gnawing. You can't hardly stand it. And you know you're only going to get that one slice of bread the next morning. That doesn't fill you up. And of course, we have to work hard all day long. And I'll assure you, those little nuns, as I covet your prayers for them, they need your prayers in more ways than one. Because you'll go to bed with a full stomach tonight. And you're very comfortable right now. But I'll assure you, there's not one of them that's comfortable. They're hungry. And they're sick. And they're wounded. And they're hurt. And they're heartsick and homesick and discouraged and worst of all seemingly they have no hope no hope you and i are looking forward to the day when we're going to see jesus they have no hope whatsoever and i surely hope you don't forget to pray for them all right that was terrible i'll assure you and then in a few mornings after this the mother spirit is taking me back for another initiation and when i go into the penance chamber this morning we come from a place up here and we're going to walk back along the uh, like that clear to the back and you know it was quite a ways back there and i, I went through part of, part of it's a tunnel and then i come out into a room and i'll walk through that room and when i get way back there i see those candles burning and i see something else Else. There's ropes hanging down from the ceiling, and oh, I'm so scared. I wonder why the ropes are falling. What's she going to do? After these two penances, you began to uh, have a lot of fear in your heart. And so I can't say anything, and I walk back there, and you know, I saw the ropes then real plain. What they're doing hanging down from that ceiling? Then she tells me, you go over there against the wall, about that close from the wall, and I have to stand sideways like this. Then she asked me to put up both of my thumbs, and I did. And then she pulled a one rope down, and there's a metal band uh, fastened securely and she fastens that around the joint of my thumb. Then the other one comes down and fastens around this thumb. And there I'm standing like this facing the wall and then you know she comes over here to the end and there's a, 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 a whatever you want to call it, she starts winding and I start moving and she's taking me right up in the air and you know when she gets me so just my toes are on the floor, just on my tiptoes, she fastens it and there I hang and all the weight of my body is on my thumbs and on my toes. Not a word is said, no one speaks a word and she walks out of that room and locks the door. If you know what it means to hear a key lock in a door and know that I'm strung up there like that, you'll never know unless you're a nun. And when that woman walked out, I didn't know how long I'll stay there, how long that woman will leave me there. And you know, they didn't come to give me food, they brought me no water. And I thought, is this it? Am I going to die back here just like this? And within a few hours, you can imagine, I'm still a human being. My muscles began to scream out with the pain. I was suffering. And that woman let me hang. Nobody come near. And what good would it do for me to cry? You can spill every tear in your body. Nobody will hear you. There's no one there to care how many tears you spill. And so I just hung there. And finally, I began to seemingly, I felt like I couldn't stand it. I'll surely die if they don't come and get me quickly. And I felt as if I was beginning to swell. I don't know how long went by. And she opened the door one morning and she had something for me to eat. And the pan water was in a pan. And it was potatoes. And those potatoes were not good to eat. They were in a pan. And there's a shelf, or a shelf over there on the wall that she can adjust to the height of the nun. And you know, she pulled it up. Now, I'm not against the wall. I'm about this far from it. But to get that food, she puts it there and says, this is your food. And she walks out. Now, how am I going to get it? She didn't let my hands down. But I, I this is what you'll learn. And you'll struggle to get it. I'm hungry. I mean, I'm so thirsty. I feel like I'm going mad. And to get it, I discovered that this hand goes high and this one will come down a little bit. And that'll keep right on going higher as I lean. I have to reach higher with this one. This one will automatically let down. And to get that, wa uh, that water and that food, I mean, I had to get it like the dogs and cats. And I lapped as much of it as I could because I'm so thirsty. And get those potatoes, I tried as hard as I could because I'm hungry. I mean, I'm hungry. And I got as much of it as I could naturally. But I was hungry. That's the way she fed me for a while and then she released the bonds on my hands and on my feet. And I tell you, then I, uh, I shouldn't have said on my feet. She didn't release the bonds. She let me hang there for nine days and nine nights. I'm getting, uh, I almost got it mixed up with one of the other penances that I want to give to you. I hung nine days and nine nights in this position. And may I say, at the time come when I was so swollen here, and naturally I could see myself puffing out here. I felt like my eyes were coming out of my head. I felt like my arms were part I could see of them right there. They were two or three sides, their normal, normal size. I felt like I was that way all all over my body and I yes may I tell you may I tell you the worst is yet to come 
This is the Coaching Edge on IRFM. The time is 12 o'clock, midnight. Brothers and sisters, this is Chad. Join us with respect for our national anthem. Let us stand and defend this one. Peace and love. Thank you. Eternal Father, bless our land. Smoking, always smoking. Lyrics like a bazooka. You are listening to Muta Baruka. It was like a boy while I was in real suffering. And then on the ninth day, she comes in and she releases the bonds from my hands and my uh, body and lets me down on the floor. Now I go down, I can't walk. I'll assure you I didn't walk. I didn't walk for a long time. But you know what? There's two little nuns that carry me out. One gets under my feet and the other under my shoulders. And they carry me in the infirmary and lay me on a slab of wood. And there they cut the clothing for my body. And let me tell you right now, nobody but God will ever know. I'm covered with vermin and filth. Why? I'm hanging there in my own human filth. There are no toilet facilities. Right behind me is a stool. And they have running water in it. And the lid is down. And they have sharp nails driven through that lid. If I break my ropes and fall on that, I would suffer terribly. And this is the life of a car, a little nun behind cloistered doors. After they've already deceived us, disobeyed illusioned us and got it back there, then this is the life that we're living. And these are the things that we're going to have to do. And I'll assure you, it isn't anything funny. And then I remember as I lived on in that place, oh, let me tell you, in the morning, we have to get up out of our beds at 4.30 in the morning. The Mother Superior taps a uh, bell, and that means five minutes to dress. And may I say to you folks, it's not five and a half minutes. You better get that clothing on in five minutes. And many, I failed one time, and I had to be punished severely, but I never failed again in all the years in the convent. And you know, when we are finished dressing, then we're going to start marching. We march by the Mother Superior. And that Mother Superior is going to appoint us to an office duty every morning. It might be scrubbing, it might be ironing, it might be washing, it might be doing some hard work. But I have to work one hour. Then we'll go in and gather around the table and we'll find sitting in front of us uh, our tin cup full of coffee and our slice of bread. And then, of course, we have hard work to do. We have, I think there was 12 tubs in the, in the convent that I lived in. And we wash on the old-fashioned washboard. We have the old fat iron that you heat on the stove. And you know, it wouldn't be so bad if we just had our own clothing in the convent, but the priests bring great bundles of clothing and put them in there because it can get them done for nothing. And we have to do that clothing on top of it. We work very, very hard, and they're not able to work because they don't have enough food to keep body, mind, and soul together. And those little girls are living under these particular circumstances. Well, I say we're women without a country. And I mean just exactly what I say, women without a country. <laughs> now we belong to the Pope. Anything they want to inflict upon my body, they can do it. And all the howling I do, if I should howl, it wouldn't make any difference because nobody's going to hear me. And they have no idea that I'll ever leave the convent. The plan is I'll die there and be buried there. Now you say, Charlotte, can you go into the convent? Any one of you folk can go into an open order convent, or I mean a closed convent, into the sick room. And there is an outside chapel that you can walk into, of any that I know anything about. But you know, you don't you just go in there and wander around to have some place to go, because you might meet something you're not expecting. 
If you go in there, you go uh, uh, prepared to take food to some little girl that's in there and be sure that you know who you're taking it to. And when you go, as you walk up toward the front of the building like this, you'll see a bell and you'll know what to do because it'll tell you. And you press a button there and there'll be a gate swing out. It has about three shelves on it. And of course, you've brought something for someone that you know in the convent. It might be the mother coming to visit her daughter. And you know when that bell is tapped, the mother superior is back here behind a big black rail. Now that's a big iron gate there, and there's heavy folds of black material clear across there. And you can't go back there. You'll never see the mother superior, but she'll answer you through the black rail. And you might say, I, I brought some homemade candy for my daughter. And you might ask the mother superior to let you speak to her. You can't see her, but you could speak to her. You know, the mother will call that lovely little girl and call her out on the other side of the grail. Of course, you can't see her. And you know what? The mother will speak to her and say, honey, are you happy here? And that little nun will say, mother, I'm very happy. You say, why did she say that? Well, bless your heart, don't you know the mother superior is standing there? And if we didn't say that, after our mother is gone, then only God knows what the mother superior will do to the little nun. And so we must lie to our mother. And then the mother will say, uh, do you have plenty to eat? And that little nun will answer and say, we have plenty to eat. But I'll tell you, that mother will go home. She'll prepare a lovely meal for the rest of the family. But if she could look in and see our table and see what her little girl is eating. Continent with Muta Baruka. We are listening to now all our men. You know here. Continent. The end. The end. These things, of course, are undercover. And we have to take what they give us. All right, now they can make us do anything. Here we are, the mother superior and I might be down in the laundry room washing. And I told you how we wash. And it's a cement floor. And uh, doing the type of laundry we do, some of it's very heavy. The water slops out on the floor. And oh, it's such a mess. We walk in it. And you know, then here comes the mother superior. And to me, a mother superior, uh, just as soon you turn loose a lion that's very hungry. And let it come walking down that aisle as to see a mother superior in a convent. I was scared to death of her. Every time I saw that woman, somebody had to suffer. And we're afraid of her. She knows we're afraid of her. Because she's cruel. Uh, sitting here hot as callous and here she comes and you know there we are washing and I tell you when she comes and we know we feel her presence before you ever see her you know her footstep and you know we'll wash a little harder but when she gets down here where we are she might address me and she'll say you come out here and I'm out there like a flash because I'm scared and then she'll say prostrate yourself down there and lick so many crosses on that floor that's a cement floor and of course I have to prostrate my body and lick those crosses and those are not the tiny crosses as far as I reach. I have to lick those crosses. And she watches my countenance. If I don't like it and she knows that I don't like it, then she might say 10. She might say 25. Say 10. She might say 25. And you know, then the next morning she may walk back through there again. And because she saw something in my face that made her to know I didn't like what she wanted me to do. She may call me again. My tongue by this time is sore. It's bleeding, but I have to look the crosses on the floor again. And then they do the same way about compelling us to crawl. They'll compel you to crawl. And I, may I say, it could be up and down an aisle like this ten times. And it'll not be a beautiful rug like this. It'll be on a floor that you'll know what you're crawling on. And you know I'm crawling, and I have to crawl like this upright. And my, my, my knees. Don't they hurt? And I might make it five or six times, and then I might not have enough strength to go the other three or four times, and I'll faint. But she'll pour some cold water on me and tell me to crawl again. And may I say then, I'll try to finish it out, and maybe the next day she compels me to crawl again. By this time, there's scabs on my knees. I mean, those knees are sore, but I must crawl again. This is the life of a little nun. We're doing penance. And then when she teaches us to believe that God is looking down out of heaven, he's smiling his approval upon those little girls. And God is made happy through our suffering. And because we are heathens, we don't know any better. We've never read the Bible. We've never had any scripture. And so those little nuns are ignorant of the word of God. You know, we are just raised under the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. And we know nothing about this lovely gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we have to do these things. Then the mother superior might walk through the cell door. By the way, in our cells, there's nothing in there but the Virgin Mary, and uh, that is, she's holding the baby Jesus, uh, baby Jesus, and there's the crucifix, and then we have a prayer board, and by the way, I'll assure you folks that you'll never want to kneel on our prayer board, we kneel on it every day, if we are able to walk under our own power, it is a board uh, about this height from the ground, and there are two leading 
coming up like this one, and this one is about that wide. I'm going to drop my knees down on it, and there's sharp wires coming up through that board. And then this one up here, I prostrate my arms on, there's going to be sharp wires. After all, I told you we were going to suffer. We were going to do penance, and this is a part of my suffering. And as I kneel on that prayer board, I'm praying for lost humanity. And I'm believing as I suffer that my grandmother will be released from a priest purgatory sooner because of my suffering. And I'll kneel there longer sometimes. Oh, it's terrible, but we don't know any better, so we do that because that's all that little nun does know. And we believe it. And there we are, and we are locked in our cells. Every night the key is turned in those doors. We can't get up and come out of there. And then more than that, seven minutes of twelve. We go to bed at 9.30, the lights are out. Seven minutes of twelve, there's two little nuns appointed to unlock every door. Every little nun again gets on her feet, dresses in full dress, goes into the inner chapel, and there we again pray one hour for lost humanity. We don't get very much sleep, that's why. And we don't have enough food, and we work hard, and we suffer much. That's why our bodies are so broken. That's why we seemingly don't have enough strength to carry on after we live there. But I'd like to say this to you as I go, uh, before I go any farther. Now, I did uh, those various things we are taught to believe, that as we spill our own blood, now we must do this. As I whip my body, if I torment it or torture it in any way that I spill blood, uh, I'm taught to believe that I'll have 100 less days to spend in purgatory. Now, you know, we have no hope. Those little nuns don't look forward to anything. You may think they do, but we don't. Why? After you live in a convent ten years, I began to realize the Virgin Mary is just a piece of metal. She's a statue. I began to realize St. Peter is just a statue. I began to realize that the statue of Jesus is just a piece of metal. In other words, we come to the place to believe that our God is a dead God. And I'll assure you, after you live in a convent long enough, not at first, oh no, but after we've suffered enough, after we've got uh, uh, so many fallen down, at the feet of those statues and spilled our tears on them and have begged them to intercede and get a prayer through to God and years go by nation of whatsoever a parent won't even know when they're dead so who's going to pray us out of purgatory or rather buy us out of purgatory no we realize after we're in there for a period of time that there is no purgatory and I of course you know there isn't and I know there isn't and there is no purgatory the only purgatory the Roman Catholic people have is a priest's pocket and they're filling his pockets with coins in order to pray for the dead. And may I say there are thousands and thousands of Roman Catholics in the month of November, may I say to you, in United States, uh, two years ago in the month of November, the Roman Catholic priest praying uh, masses for the dead of the Roman Catholic people in this country in one month collected $22 million for masses said for dead Roman Catholics. That's just a little idea, a sample of what's going on in this country. And still there are thousands of mothers that have worked their fingers to the bone to go over there and give the priest another five dollars to say a mass for a loved one that's in a purgatory because that mother believes there is a purgatory in the convent they have a painting of purgatory and there's nothing in the room but just that painting and you know every friday we have to walk around that painting and when we walk around it i would you could look at the little nun's faces what do i see the painting as you would walk around it looks like it's a big deep hole out there and there are people down in there and the flames of fire is lapping around of the bodies of those people and their hands are outstretched like this and the mother will say to the little nun you better go and put another penance on your body those people are begging to get out of that fire and because we're heathens we don't know any better I might go someplace in the convent and maybe I'll burn my body real bad maybe I'll torture it some way and spill some more blood because as I suffer I believe they're going to get out of that place where a priest puts them and there are millions of people so to speak in purgatory that your priest have put there and when he knows it is the biggest fraud there is in the world he knows there's not a bit of truth to it and bless your heart I often say you take purgatory and mass away from the Roman Catholic Church you'll rob her of nine tenths of her living she'll starve to death if you would take it away from her she commercializes not only off of the living but off of the dead and on and on it goes all right it doesn't bother a mother superior to take one of those dear little girls and may I say, you know, when the priests come into the convent, they come as our father confessors. Once a month we go to confession. And we don't want to go, don't you worry. I many of the time have got in the very back row. I didn't want to go in there. I know who's out there. One of them, I would may not know the particular man, but I know he's a priest. And I know those priests. I, I certainly have seen them enough. I've lived there long enough. I, I certainly have had contact with every one of them. And I'll assure you this one thing. I don't trust one single one of those in the convent. Now, we're not telling you about it. Shut up.
Capital Express for transportation to Rebel Salute. Buses leave Portmore 5 p.m. and Spanish Town 5 30 p.m. Call Shuttle Express at 988-7763 for more info. info, info, info. Thought provoking, always smoking. Lyrics like a bazooka. You are listening to Muta Baruka. Every priest, I don't know all the priests. I'm just talking about the convent and my personal testimony of convent life. And you know, we know uh, something about what's out in that room. And here we are. We know we're going to confession today. It may take all day long. And here he comes. And I have never seen a Roman Catholic priest come into the convent that I was in without intoxicating liquor under his belt. And I say a man or a woman, regardless of who you may be, when you get liquor under your belt, you're not a man. Neither are you a woman. You become an animal and a beast. And so we have a beast sitting out there. There's a straight uh, back high bottom chair. No other furniture but the crucifix of the Virgin Mary. But here he is sitting on that chair right out there in the middle of that room. Now here a little girl has to walk out there alone. And she has to kneel down. Think of it. Why bless your heart. I, I really sometimes I'm saved now. I'm out of the convent. And I now look back at that Roman Catholic priest and I often say I'm sure he was a twin brother to the devil because he's full of sin. He's full of vice. He's full of corruption. And we go out there and kneel down at his knees. Now, are you a lucky girl if you get away from that man without being destroyed? Why, he's drunk. He's a beast. He's not a man. Oh, he has a holy habit on. He's an ordained Roman Catholic priest. And so I'll assure you, we don't like to go to confession. But we must go once a month. And those little girls can't help themselves. And nobody comes out, out into that room but the priest and I until it's all over. And then we can come back. And the next one will have to come. And I'll assure you, we don't appreciate that day. And those little girls don't know any better. They don't know anything about the plan of salvation. They don't know that Jesus went to Calvary and died for them. They don't know that he shed his blood for them. Those little girls know nothing about it. Because to me, as I repeat again, the Bible was a hidden book to every one of those little girls. And so now they can do things like this. Now, if a Roman Catholic priest comes into the convent, he may go to the mother superior and ask her to permit him to go into the cell where one of the nuns are. And you know that mother with her carnal mind and her carnal heart and she's very hard and very carnal and she is the mother many times of many illegitimate children they belong to the priest and you know she'll take that priest and he's drinking she knows it they bring liquor in with them sometimes some of the nuns will drink with them and the mother usually drinks with them and it's really a terrible place it is not a religious order it does not uh, live up to that name whatsoever but here she brings that priest into one of our cells now I wonder if you realize how serious it is uh, that Roman Catholic priest he has liquor under his belt, we know that. But he has a big, boss, strong body. He's had three spare meals uh, of food every day of his life. He can eat all the food that he wants. But you know, there's a little nun that may have a broken body. And she may not have very much strength. And what did, was he, what did he come into that cell for? For nothing other than to destroy that little nun. I often say I wish the government could walk into a convent just about the time one of those priests are let in the cell. The mother will turn a key in the lock and you're locked in there with that priest. Now, uh, we have no way to defend ourselves. And I often say, I have had to nurse those little girls. I'm an RE and I got my nurse's training by going through the tunnel over to the, uh, through the hospital uh, as I lived in a, an open order convent. But may I say, uh, after that priest is taken out of there, if you could look upon the body of that little nun, she looks like something you've thrown out in a hog pen. And a half a dozen old sows have just mauled that child's body. And this is convent life. I can understand why your priests are calling over the phone every day or two and screaming their heads off because I'm in this city giving this testimony. But may I say to you, I don't mind if they continue to scream. I don't mind what they do. I'm not one bit afraid of them. I'll continue to give this testimony. As long as God gives me strength, I'll be giving this testimony regardless of your priests or your bishops in this country. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm saying. And I'm not afraid of anybody in all of this world. I'm a child of God. And I believe God won't let anybody put a hand on me until my work is finished. And then I often say, I don't care what you do to my body after I leave this body. I'm sure I don't mind. And so I, I will continue to give the testimony regardless of what your priests think about it. Because I, I think God saved me to pull the cover off of convents. I believe he saved me to uncloak those places that are riding under the cloak of religion. I believe that with all of my heart. I'll assure you I do. Now if I refuse... 
to give my body. You know we're just supposed to give our bodies voluntarily to those priests. Many times the nuns are overpowered. But if I refuse to give my body voluntarily to them, then you know he becomes very angry, and he goes immediately to the Mother Superior. Then when two carnal minds tend to come together, they can invent things that you and I, we don't have enough evil in our heart to invent things like that. We don't have enough sin in our lives to even think of such terrible things. And when those two carnal minds come together, uh, the next time, I want you to know they're all ready. Now the Mother Superior might say to me in a day or two, we're going to do penance. Now the penance that they'll inflict on me is something that the Mother Superior and the priest has invented, and it can be very, very cruel. They might take me down into one of the dirty dungeons, and there's no floors in those places, and you know they have uh, a place down there, there are rods about three feet long, they have a, a burrow down into cement, and at the top of it there's a ring about this big, out sticking out of the ground. They have some leather straps fastened there, and when they take me down there, they put my foot, either foot through those, through those rings, and then they strap my ankle securely. Now I'm standing with my feet in those uh, rings. All right, they're going out of there. They're going to leave me locked up in that place by myself. And it's a dirty place. Well, I might stand there for two or three hours if I have strength enough in my body. But what do you think is going to happen to me then? Uh, I can't stand any longer. Sometimes we faint. Sometimes we just become exhausted and, and we go down. But when I go down, it flips my ankles over like that. And I can't do anything about it. I don't have what it takes for me to get up. I may have to lie in that position for two or three days and no one will come near. They won't give me a bite of food. They won't bring me one drop of water. But I must stay there. And the next thing you feel is the bugs crawling over my body and the mice running over me. And I still have to stay there. I can understand why they don't want me to uncover. They don't want the world to know these things are going on. No priest in this country wants it. And if he doesn't want the, uh, these day, uh, the world to know it, then they better be pretty careful that nobody ever gets out of a convent after they spent a few years back there. But may I say again to you, my God, he's greater than all the outside forces. My God can reach his hand over into those convents, this country, any other country, and make a way for a girl to come out and he won't have to ask the bishop to help him. He won't have to ask the priest to help him. But God can make a way for us to come out. I'll assure you that. Well, on it goes. Then sometimes the priests come and they get angry at us because we refuse to sin with them voluntarily. And you know, after all, uh, the, uh, the nun's bodies are broken after we're there a while. And many, many the time, to have him strike you in the mouth is a terrible thing. I've had my front teeth knocked out. I know what it's all about. And then they get you down on the floor and then kick you in the stomach. Many of those precious little girls have babies under their heart. And it doesn't bother a priest to kick you in the stomach with a baby under your heart. He doesn't mind the baby's going to be killed anyway because those babies are born in the convent. Why wouldn't babies be born when you run places like this under the cloak of religion? The world thinks it's religious orders. And there are babies born in Dale. And most of the babies are premature. Many of them are abnormal. Very, very seldom do we ever see a normal baby. You say, Sister Shada, do you dare to say that? I most definitely do dare to say this. And I intend to keep on saying it. Why? I've delivered those babies with these hands. And what I've seen with my eyes and I've done with my hands, I just challenge the whole world to say it isn't true. And the only way they can ever prove it isn't true, they'll have to open if they ever serve a summons on me and call me into court. I'll assure you this one thing. Convents are coming open. And then the world is going to know what convents really are. And they'll have to open them to vindicate my testimony. Because I know what I'll do if they ever serve a summons on me. I've been before the highest laws we have in the United States. I know what I'm doing. I know what I can say. And I'm not one bit afraid to say it. Because I've been a part of this. I've been connected with this system 22 years behind convent doors. And it is a terrible thing. After when that dear little nun looking forward to that day when her precious baby will be born. Most of you, dear mothers, oh, you have everything ready. The beautiful nursery. All the baby's beautiful clothes are made. Everything is lovely. You're looking forward to that precious little immortal soul that's going to be born into your home. And everything is ready. And oh, I wish you could see that little nun. She's not looking forward to that. There won't ever be a blanket around his body. There'll never even, they'll never bathe the ba that baby's body. But he can only live four or five hours. And then the mother superior will take that baby, put her fingers in his nostril and uh, cover his mouth and snuff his little life out. And why did they build the, the lime pits in the convent? What is the reason for building it if it isn't to kill the babies? And that baby will be taken into the lime pit and chemical and lime is put over its body. And that's the end of babies. Oh, when I think about it, that's why I try to challenge people, pray. If you know how to pray, you know how to contact God, pray and ask God to deliver the con girls from behind convent doors. In other words, pray that God will make a way for every convent in the United States to be opened and let the government go in. And when the government goes in, 
You won't have to worry. The convents will be open, the nuns will be taken out, and they'll be closed up. Just as they opened the convents in old Mexico in 1934, there are no convents in old Mexico. Every cluster is open, and they found all of the corruption back there, the lime pit. If any of you are taking a vacation, go over in old Mexico. The, uh, the government owns them. They're public museums. And go through the convent. Look with your own eyes. Touch with your own hands. And then come home and see if you believe my testimony. It'll stir every bit of red blood in your veins. I mean, it'll do something to you that nothing else has ever been able to do. Go through them and uh, look at them. Go into the dun uh, dungeons. Go into the tunnels. Go through the lime pit. Uh, look at the skulls. Rooms of skulls over there. And then ask the guides uh, where they come from. And go and see the, uh, all of the devices of torture they placed upon the bodies of the little nuns. Go into their, their, uh, their cells and look at their beds and see for yourself. Oh, yes, you can go. It'll cost you 25 cents to go through each one of them. You look at those things and see them for yourself and then come home and maybe it'll give you a greater burden to pray for little girls that have been enticed behind convent doors by the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. I wonder how you would feel if this was your child. And remember, I have a mother and daddy or had one. And they love me just as much as you love your children. And when they let me go into the convent, I'm sure my mother and daddy didn't expect these things to happen because they didn't know. They never dreamed a convent was like this. But you know, I wonder how you'd feel if you could walk in someday and out there in this particular room. That floor is built for this purpose. There's a, 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 a partition right out there. And there's just a little thing they can touch. It automatically opens. And you know there's a deep hole underneath that floor. And this little nun has done something. I can't tell you what she's done. Because I wasn't there when she done it. But she's done something. And to them it's very serious. And when they bring her, they bring her to this particular place. Her, her little hands and feet are going to be bound securely. They're going to drop her in that horrible, horrible pit. And then they're going to put the boards back down. No one will ever know. Oh, there's plenty of chemical in mine down there. But you know they don't do that. Six little nuns have to walk around that hole. We'll chant as we walk around that hole. We don't want any evil spirits to come out into the convent. So we sprinkle holy water over that hole. Then we may walk for six hours. And then they'll appoint six more nuns. And on and on it goes until we ha hear the last moan. And that's the end of the little nun they place down there. No, she'll never be delivered from the convent. But does it bother you to know that that little nun will die and be lost? Does that bother you? It bothers me. Because I didn't know Jesus. I couldn't tell her about God. I didn't know him myself. But it bothers me very, very much. But God won't hold me accountable. Her blood will not be on my hands because I didn't know the Lord. And I couldn't tell her about it. And so on it goes. And I wonder how you like to see us. Here we are. A body of those little nuns on this particular morning. The mother superior might say this. We're all going to be lined up here. And I don't know what she's lining me up for. And then you know there might be ten of us. There might be fifteen of us. And then she'll tell us all to strip. And we have to take every stitch of our clothing off. We're certainly not anything beautiful to look at. Our eyes are back in our head. Our cheeks are falling in. Our bodies are wasted. God only knows what we look like because I never saw myself in 22 years. I didn't know I had gray hair. I didn't know I had lines in my face. I didn't know how old I was. I only found that out about six years ago. You know nothing about what you look like. And here we are lined up. And here comes two or three Roman Catholic priests with liquor under their belt. And there they're going to march in front of those nude girls and choose the girl they want to take to the cell with them. These are convents, cloistered convents, not open orders. The priest can do anything he wants to and hide behind the cloak of religion. And that same Roman Catholic priest will go back into the Roman Catholic churches and there he'll say mass. And there you'll go into the confessional box and make those poor people believe he can give them absolution from their sin. When he's full of sin, when he's full of corruption and vice, still he acts as their God. What a terrible thing it is. And all it goes, well, I live there. Now all the time these things are going on, what you think's happening inside of Charlotte? God love your hearts. I didn't know people could hold so much hatred and bitterness. And it went on and on and on. I was filled with bitterness and hatred. And I mean it continued to build. I began in my heart to think, when I can get the Mother Superior in a certain place, I'll kill her. Isn't it awful to get murder in our hearts? I didn't go in the convent with a heart like that, nor a mind like that. But I began to plan murder in the convent. How I could kill her, how I could kill a Roman Catholic priest, and on and on it goes. And oh, I tell you, every time she did fix something awful on my body that I'd have to suffer so terribly, when I could think sensibly again, then I would begin to plan how could I kill that woman. And on it goes.
goes, well, after all, you can't help it. For instance, I wonder how you would feel. The mother superior, here she is, and she's going to sit me down in a chair. And you know, uh, that chair is a uh, straight back, hard bottom, and I, I don't have any hair. She's going to take everything off my head. And you know, she's going to put my hands like this. They'll be out here in stocks. And I'm going to have to bend my head over like that in order to put the stocks across my neck. And I'm fastened securely. And over my head, there is a faucet of water. And you know... Sorry. There is a faucet of water just above my head, and my head's over. Now that mother's going to turn that water on just a drop, and the drop will just come about this fast. It'll hit me right there on the back of my head. And you know, I can't move either way. I sat there one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. What do you think's going on? I'm sitting there. I can't move. I do everything to get away from that drop of water in the same spot on my head. Why, God love your heart, if you could look in. You'd see us frothing at the mouth. You'd see those little girls. They're trying so hard to move to get away from that water. And they let us stay there sometimes ten hours all day long. Many, many times a little nun cracks up, cups, uh, cracks up completely. She goes stark raving mad under this particular penance. What in the world did they do with her? I tell you in a few minutes. Don't you worry. They have a place for us after we go mad in the convent. They take care of us. They have places for their little nuns. There's places built down there for us. Well, on it goes. Well, you know, these things went on and went on and went on. And it was terrible. But, you know, I began to plan and plan and plan. After she's done something like that to me, it's terrible. One day, the mother superior took violently ill. You say, who would take her place? There are about three, sometimes they have four older nuns. And they always pick the one that's hard. The one that seem as, seemingly as carnal. That one that has no conscience to be a mother superior. And she works under this one. One day if something happens to the main mother superior, another one will take her place. And on it goes. But you know this uh, particular day, they sent word to me. The mother superior, I was to come into her room. She's very sick. And quicker than lightning, I began to think, if I get in that mother superior's room, I know what I'll do. You know, after all, I'm a sinner. I'm a nun, but I'm a sinner. And I don't know God. And I have a lot of hatred in my heart. And I walk in that room. They have called in an outside Roman Catholic doctor. She's a very sick woman. And he has left all orders. And they left the medicine and everything. Now I'm supposed to take care of her. And that was wonderful. And I do take care of her. All day long, I did what they told me to do, what I'm supposed to do. And those particular tablets, I knew what they were, and I knew what they would do, and what she was taking them for. But anyway, all day long, I gave her her medicine. I done everything I'm supposed to. All evening long, why? I want to be sure what I'm doing. What I do, I have to be careful. And you know, I waited until uh, 1 o'clock in the morning. Why? Because every night, those little nuns have to be gotten out of bed and go chant from 1, or from 12 to 1, 7 minutes to 12 to 1. I thought, I'll wait till all the nuns go back to bed, then I'm going to do something. And bless your hearts, after they were all back in their beds, I'll tell you what I did. I took five or six of those tablets. I was only supposed to take one in a half a glass of water every day. Third World in a Circle, Luciano, Alba Rosie, Jesse Royal, Iba Mar, River Salute 2015. Pottery of him, thought provoking, always smoking. Lyrics like a bazooka. You are listening to Muta Baruka. Bless your hearts after they were all back in their beds. I'll tell you what I did. I took five or six of those tablets. I was only supposed to take one in a half a glass of water ever so often and give it to her. But because of the type they were and what the type of uh, tablet it was, I knew what it would do. I put six of them in a glass of water and stirred them up. And I gave them to her. I knew she would go into convulsions. It would twist her completely out of shape. I knew that woman would suffer a million deaths within 25 minutes. I knew that. And I thought, I'm going to watch her suffer. So many thousands of times I watch her suffer. Isn't it terrible to think a child can be live, live in a place like that long enough until she has the same kind of a heart almost a mother superior has? But that's what comes when sin gets in your life. And so I waited. You know, I gave them to her. And I, something happened to me. I got scared. And I looked at that woman and she began to change color. And I couldn't find her pulse. I couldn't find her respiration. I was frightened. And I thought, oh, what shall I do? If they find her dead, only God knows what they'll do to me. I'll tell you what I did. I got that stomach pump. I pump as quick as I could. I pumped that woman's stomach. I massaged that woman. I done everything there was to do. Oh, thank God she didn't die. I said, I thank God. But you know, I sat down by the bed and held her hand and watched her carefully until the respiration came back normal, until 
until her pulse was normal and I felt she would live. And I thought of another thing, I'll do this then. I saw where her keys were hid in her shelf right there in her own room. So they're on a big chain or a big ring and I thought I'm going to take those keys. I'm going down into that dungeon. There's a, when I say down, this is two stories under the ground. I, I'm going someplace where she's always wandered. It's a solid wall like that and clear to the back end of that wall, there's one door and it's heavy and it's always locked. And I've heard her tell me scores of times and I'm sure she has the others, don't ever try to go through that door. What in the world is over there? And why did she tell us that? We can't get through it. It's locked. But you know, I wondered what was back there. Because when they had me in the dungeon for a long time once, I heard screams under the ground. I heard such blood curdling screams and I knew there were some girls locked up somewhere. And so I'm going through there if I find the key. And so I got her keys and I went into that particular place. And when I got and I went into that particular place. And when I got back there, it took a while to do it. I want you to know to find the key. But all oh, but it unlocked that door. I walked through that door and I walked into a hall. The hall, I would say, was maybe five feet wide, maybe wider than that. That's just a, uh, a guess. And anyway, uh, on the other side of the hall, there were a number of cells over there, small rooms. And they had real heavy doors. And in those cells were little nuns. And when I went up to the first one, uh, near the top of the door, there's a little place about this long, it's about that wide, and it has iron bars going across there. And I looked right into the face of a little nun that I knew, one that I'd sit across the table from, one that I prayed with in the chapel. I knew that girl. And here she is, and they had chains and lock chains around the either of her wrist and around her waistline. And I said, when did you have something to eat last? And no answer. How long have you been here? No answer. I went down to the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the stench was getting so bad I couldn't stand it. And you know those little girls would not talk. Why? I lived in the convent, you know, a long time. Uh, every, I don't care if I was two miles under the convent, way back there. We were working back there, and we'd whisper, the next day I'd have to suffer because the convents are wired. And the mother can, superior can hear every voice, every whisper, and then somebody tells, and you're in some serious trouble. And those nuns have been there long enough. What have they done? I don't know. But those nuns are supposed to have cracked up mentally, and so they have to put them in those chains. And when they die, they can't fall down to the floor. They're just dropping those chains and slump. When they go in there, they don't give them any more food. No more water. That's a slow death. And so I, I, as I saw all of that, I became so sick from the terrible stench because many of them are already dead. And I don't know how long they've been dead. I came out of there and walked back up to uh, this room where the Mother Supreme was, and she was lying there sleeping. And I watched her carefully, and she slept till the next day, uh, long, long hours, and didn't waken. And when she did, she said, I've had a long sleep. And I said, yes. They let me take care of her for three days. And you know the third day? I don't know. You say, did she ever find out you was down there? Well, not yet. I hope she didn't while I was there. But anyway, at three days, they put me out in the kitchen. Uh, in other words, when we go to the kitchen, six of us go for a six-week period. On this particular time, they put me out in the kitchen with five other little nuns. What am I there for? I'm doing the kitchen work. I'm going to do all the cooking that's done out there and take care of the work, the work in the kitchen. And so when I went out in the kitchen, we have a long table back here. And the stench was getting so bad I couldn't stand it. And you know, those little girls would not talk. Why? I lived in the convent, you know, a long time. Uh, every, I don't care if I was two miles under the convent, way back there. We were working back there, and we'd whisper, the next day I'd have to suffer because the convents are wired. And the mother can, superior can hear every voice, every whisper, and then somebody tells, and you're in some serious trouble. And those nuns have been there long enough. What have they done? I don't know. But those nuns are supposed to have cracked up mentally, and so they have to put them in those chains. And when they die, they can't fall down to the floor. They're just dropping those chains and slump. When they go in there, they don't give them any more food. No more water. That's a slow death. And so I, I, as I saw all of that, I became so sick from the terrible stench because many of them are already dead. And I don't know how long they've been dead. I came out of there and walked back up to uh, this room where the Mother Supreme was, and she was lying there sleeping. And I watched her carefully, and she slept till the next day, uh, long, long hours, and didn't waken. And when she did, she said, I've had a long sleep, and I said, yes. They let me take care of her for three days. And you know the third day? I don't know. You say, did she ever find out she was down there? Well, not yet. I hope she didn't while I was there. But anyway, at three days, they put me out in the kitchen. Uh, in other words, when we go to the kitchen, six of us go for a six-week period. On this particular time, they put me out in the kitchen with five other little nuns. What am I there for? I'm doing the kitchen work. I'm going to do all the cooking that's done out.
out there and take care of the work, the work in the kitchen. And so when I went out in the kitchen, we have a long table back here, and it's a work table. And our vegetables will be, be prepared for the soup, and that's what we were doing, all six of us. And something happened. Our kitchen is a very large room, and a very long room, not as wide as it is long. And over one end of it, you'll find over here the stair steps leading, about four of them leading down. Then there's a landing right there. Over there is a big, heavy outside door. But here there's a landing. Our garbage cans sit there. And right here is a stairway, cement one, leading down one story under the ground. Now, I'm up on first floor in this kitchen. All right, uh, as I'm in there and we're there working, something happens. Somebody touched a garbage can. You know, all my convict life, we are taught never to break silence. We don't dare to make noises in the convict. We are punished for them. And when something touched the garbage can, that's a noise. And who in the world, six of us, and we're all together, who's touching the garbage can? I wheeled around, and they wheeled around, and we saw a man. And you know, that man was picking up the full can, a leaf an empty one. I've never seen that before. I've been in that convent for years but I, and in the kitchen, but I never saw anything like that happen. I believe God had his hand on me. With all my heart, I believe it. And you say, what happened? Well, I, I, we turned around quickly because he, uh, it's to us, it's a mortal sin to look upon a man other than a Roman Catholic priest. And I mean, we turned around quickly and went to our work. But you know, I thought, well, if that man comes back again to get another full can, I'm going to give him a note and I'm going to ask him if I can run out with him. But I didn't do that. But you know what I did? When we run out or something in the kitchen. There's a pencil hanging up there on a chain. And bless your heart, I have to, or whoever it is runs out, you have to write it on a tab. And of course, I stole a piece of paper off of a sack. And I thought I'll carry that little piece of paper in my skirt pocket. And every time I can get a hold of that pencil, I'm going to write a word or two on a note. And that's what I did. It took quite a while to do it. But oh, I watched that garbage can. Every time I could take the garbage down there, I did it. And you know when it was just about full. And I thought the next evening, it'll be full when we put all the garbage in it. And so the that afternoon I broke my crucifix and I laid it up on a shelf and I had a hard time doing it because they're watching me. But I did it and I laid it up on a shelf and I did that to have a way to get back to that uh, room, of course. And so I, uh, when our dinner work is over, our supper dishes, everybody has to go out at the same time and we march by the Mother Superior. And you know, when I marched by, I stopped and said, please, may I speak to you? And I did. And I said, Mother Superior, I broke my crucifix and I left it in the kitchen. May I go for it? And of course, no nun goes without her crucifix. And she said, how did you break it? I lied to her. Everything she asked me, I lied to her. Uh, you say, why did you lie? She lies to us. And we're all sinners, so we all lie. And it doesn't make any difference in there. And so we lied. And I lied to her. And then finally she said, you go get the crucifix and come right back. And that's all I wanted anyway. I have to have a reason. You can't go back to the kitchen after you've left it. And so I didn't go for the crucifix, but she thought I did. And I run for this uh, tin can. Why? That night when I put my garbage in there, I put a note right on top of that garbage and left the lid off, which I was not supposed to do. And you know, I said on the note to the garbage man, if you get this, won't you please help me out? Won't you do something to help the little nuns out? I told him about those 19 cells down there and those 19 nuns in him. I told him about some of the babies that have been killed. I told him some other little nuns that are locked up in the dungeons and they're bound with chains. I told him a plenty. And I said, won't you help us? And if you will, please leave a note under the empty can. That's what I went back for. And when I lifted up the can and found a note, you don't know how I felt. I froze to the floor. I was so scared I didn't know what to do. I picked that piece of paper up and I read, and this is what that man said. I'm leaving that door unlocked, and I'll leave the big iron gate unlocked. You come out. Oh, let me tell you, that's almost more than you'd ever... Well, I never dreamed I'd get out of a convent. I never thought of ever getting out. I wanted out, but you say, uh, oh, yes, I, when I could collect myself. I reached over and turned the knob, and you know it was put unopened. I walked out of that convent, and I slammed it through. I was sure the lock was on it, and I got out to the big iron gate, but, oh, he had me trapped. Ari of M. That iron gate was just as provoking. Always smoking. Lyrics like a bazooka. You are listening to Muta Baruka. Hey, Yata. Yeah, Bessel. Yeah, yes, sir. What's an edge? We know that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You live on the year? Uh, yeah, you live on the year. Mm. Well, a long time in a talk, I mean, what is it? Even <laughs> give me that check for you, say, yeah, check, come check me. You know, so we realize how I talk to me now. <laughs> you see there, you see there, no, no, no. We realize how I, oh, you know what? I mean, you know, what a year, we don't hear from you, man. You stop this to go to the edge, man. The, come on, man. Now, what do you mean? Uh, so, what do I do? What do I do? I have to send it up to you, then up to your base. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like cousin, they come check you up at your base up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, tell us, uh, where, where, where. Is that plan something? 
Right, right, right. Him come and him tell me, say, you let him in a, in a your house, you let him in a, in a your house and thing, man, and mm. go right through motor house, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You look yeah. you to drive, you look a bus, the fam down, uh, below you, there, so, the, the, mm. the, 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 um, yeah, man, we have that. All right. So, you right. have, have to go remember to deal with it. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. So, look at the teacher. Do. The teacher now remember things. All right. <laughs> put everything good with the family. Yeah, do. man. We are going through, man. Give Health thanks, man. Strength, give everything time, pretty. Time. Yeah, man. Give thanks to your friend, your man. Rest of all right. So, sweet, we sweet, talk, sweet. eh? Yes. All right. Bless. Yes. May I tell you. Sweet, sweet call. That. that is a sweet call. Believe you me, it's a sweet call. Trust me. Sweet call. Yeah. Now, seduce to reduce my knowledge. Stepping. Cutting edge. This is my ear. I'm telling you, really. When they are cutting, when they are stepping, they are cutting it at the same time. All right. Hello, Muta. Yes, sir. A Papa DC, man. Great man. Yeah. Are you named Great Man? You know? Remember me, you're the only man called a Great Man. All right, sir. Yeah, you remember a fine guy. Wait, sir, you're the only man called me Great Man. Yeah, because you're a great man. You, are you Peter take up Marcos Gary? Peter Bunty. Peter Bunty called me so too. No, him come after me, man. That's the first <laughs> man called you Great Man. Because he's a great man. All you right, don't sir. know that. All right, sir. Yeah, remember me, Papa Dichi. Mm. Me and Kingstown, them in England. I get a wee All right, sir. So where are they there now? You're there in England still? No, man. I want to plant it with the ark. With the ark, chill on the chill. <laughs> yeah, talk too much in the, in the mic. In the, the phone. All right, all right. Because my phone now works all right. This is what I say. Yeah. Muta. Mm. You see the people you play with, with the, with the Muslim man, tape one. The Muslim man. Yeah, remember tape one when I tell you about this Jesus business, all kind of something. No, which, which, which you have to remind In me. August gone, man, August gone. Mm. And you said, you said, I should go on YouTube and get that, because yes, you're not yes. going to give no one it. No, 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 I never said, I'm not going to give no one. I say, I bet you get it on the YouTube. Because no, no, me just come back in here and tell Jamaica, you know, you are a journalist, you know. Remember, you are a journalist. Mm. You are a man. Start out your thing them before you deal with them. And you the man know things. You don't go talk things. Mm. You, you check out the thing them. That's how I deal with it. Kingston can tell yeah. you that and land and ask you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. me yeah. And me as the man that call a great man. And me don't deal with nonsense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. This is what I say to you, great man. Yes, me, me want to pay for that tape because me want to get it. The one that the one from down uh, Egypt. You remember the brother in Egypt? The Muslim man. Well, I, mean, I try to remember where you're talking about. The tape that done, August ago, man. Where, where, you where, 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 You have tape three, tape oh, two, shadows, and tape shadows, one. Shadows, shadows. You must have more money one at the time. The origin of money, too. Yes. I, I need shadows. that. I need it, you know. Because all of my tape, what I take from Jamaica to England, they steal them in England. I remember that question. You use computer? Computer. I use computer, I'm just back All in right. the well, country. Yeah, no, wait, no, hold on, no, hold on, no, man. May I explain something to you? Yeah. If you use computer, go by YouTube and put shadows, money, and then you will get it, the tape. You understand All what right. I'm saying? Shadows Great 1, man. shadows 2. Great, Great yeah. man, listen to me carefully. Yes. You are taking your family a little boy when you are doing your poem from little... Yeah. Be a food. Yeah, you're still be a food. But you're going to do what you're going to tell you to do. You're going to keep talking about me. Yeah, no, no. I'm going to do what you say. Go to but YouTube. Need... Go to YouTube. Yeah. yeah. And put Shadows 1 and Shadows 2. All right. Tell you what, Melo. We'll call up a command and get all the information. No, I'm but you don't get need no more information more than what I just tell you. No, because at this moment, I'm the, I'm not in the position to have pen to write down this and write down But you don't need to write down that, Bridget. You go to YouTube. I'm putting shadows one and shadows two, and then you will see it, and then all you have to do is just listen to it from this. All right, shadows one and shadow two. Yes, shadows, not shallow. Shadows. Shadows. S H A D O W S. Shadows. Yes. Yes. Are you going to get the tape? You know? Are you Yeah, are you going to get the tape then? All right. All right, great man. Remember me, name Papa Dichi, the color yes, great sir. man. All right, sir. Yeah, and right. remember me with Snicker from them days from way back. Yeah. 
Good morning. Good morning. Why motor? The tape that touching bad. I tell you. Touch I remove my bad. Where they see me gonna wait for later for shout. So where they are the first to hear it? I don't remember hearing it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but, but, yeah. But you know, sometimes you hear it before and then when you hear it again at the time when you hear it again, it really touch you, you know. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. It's Trust terrible, me, man. Trust me. It's terrible thing, terrible. You didn't know, say. The, I, I now call the name of the church in Jamaica, you see? Mm-hmm. Them did find some bones of some little children. Me, yeah, you talk about it all the time. Under the altar. Yes, some yeah, little but, children. That's how the days when them used to ball the nun them head. Them stop ball nun head down do. I'm out a long time here, say. We always hear talk, say, you know, say, priest them, uh, with the nun them, uh, with the boy them, and then sitting there. Yeah, that, uh, up, up to now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, the little altar boy them, man. Mm-hmm. Abuse the little altar boy them, terrible. Some of them grow big now and just feel to talk about it. Yeah. Well, them the little, you know, now that them come big man now and people can't do nothing to them. Mm. Them just started to talk about it. A great, a well-known man in a Jamaica was guilty of that until one time little gay, gay guys them kill him. <laughs> yes, one time little gay guys them kill him, man. Well, well-known man too. Big, big executive man. And the way I'm out, I can get a fine warning so I have to talk to you later. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, I'm a little six-year-old going to be seventh um, Friday. Yes, serious? Yeah, man, he said, Grandma, I hope you call Uncle Muta Thursday now and <laughs> make him talk about my birthday. Birthday, all right. I will have a call to her for me, I know. No, I forgot. No, I'm going in at the house. I'm okay. asleep now. All so right. They come over and help me. I call you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, man. Bless it. Give thanks. Give thanks. Peter. Yes. Don't teach me any lessons. Right, man. Never give up your pride. Yes. Greetings. Cut- yes. Cutting edge. Healy eye. Rastafari. Give thanks and praise to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and conquering Lion of the Tribe of Judah. You know? Mm. Yeah, man. Me give thanks to the eye motor. Yeah, man. I'm here to tell you, say, it's what you do and not for yourself, you know, because you know that already. No, well, I just see like, me and one and one out here, you know? All right. So, you know, say, where would the part of the way I couldn't feel myself? Would I be uh, Yeah, but you don't know. Well, Knowledge has to be shared, you know? Yeah, man, of course. And that's cutting edge there for though. Boy, I'm here tell you, Mota, trust me. Cutting edge make me know myself, you know? Mm. And make me feel powerful, me I tell you. Oh, you mean, man? You listen to all them tape, them, and you one nice way I go on. Boy, I'm here oh, tell you. Oh, the say, system uh, set up and make, make, make you feel like you are the, the wicked one, you know? You see? Yeah, man, they make you feel like you are the terrible one, you know, when I really them. Boy, I'm tell you, Mota. i tell you, Aya. Enough time looking at myself, I'm say, Jano, where was I from birth to join this mad crew, yeah, man? Mm. Come here, myself, say, he's a mad crew, me, and I say, he's a mad man, you know, because you know, say, more time when me reason with some people, them say, me a mad man. Oh, yeah? And you know what I notice? Mm. You see, for, you know, go the way of life as the majority of people are, you know, uh, believe in what they believe and think the way they might think yeah, and agree with their position. Them say you're mad. You're a madman. Mm. Yes, car. Me don't know much about, about bedward, you know. But as far as me, I get to understand them, did say boy, bedward was a madman, too. Ah, uh, a woolly pa man, then, then, then we there, you know how much time... Le, uh, Leonard uh, Owell go, 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 go to Bellevue. <laughs> I love time well, I'm going to be a big man I'm charging for lunacy I'm charging for sedition trees and all that other thing why most of them things they know when they used to do them things to our ancient them you know mm. it's just to discourage the rest you know of course yeah man because for the man I'm going to say you're a madman and then take you off the street and charge you for sedition or put you at a madhouse or hospital or thing like that if to tell the followers to go high, but hold on, yeah. one of them are really mad. So if you're not strong in your med, mm. you're going to just give up the fight, you know? Yeah, that's your yeah, man. Then you know, so them youths, so, the, a, a pregnant woman a, in a slavery, a husband, them youths, so, time between two hearts and I'm beating, you know, I make the pregnant woman watch that, you know, you know what that for? See, impact on her baby. Yeah, that's when she, the baby comes. She won't make the baby rebel against slavery. 
Oh. Because when she look at where I go on with fear her husband, you know, she don't want fear her picnic go through that thing. No, sir. So no she, make her, she, she make her baby become, yeah, she make her baby become so passive. And him grow up so passive that him start to accept slavery as a normal thing. You know, see it? And them still do it at all. Yeah, them still do it at all. You know that man, that's why it's as a song a place the boy can not give up your sanity, you know? Yeah, you think if Paul Bogle was alive now, they would have said my hero? Nigga mad. They would have run him down and shoot him, see him way. You think if, if, if Sam Sharp, Sam Sharp was alive now, you think say, the Minister of Security <laughs> would have healed him up as no hero? You're mad, man. I tell you, man. You think if Taki was alive now, you think the Minister of Security or the Prime Minister would have run up and down and say, boy, this man is a great man? <laughs> no, sir. Okay. Well, I'm just a right answer. man, them back to them dead already. Yeah, to them dead already. Yeah. That's one of them, them did a fight against personality, too. Mm. Aye. Come here, raise me some bridging of history in the moat. I say, boy, the church have his rightful position, you know, but them just don't know it and them just don't know what to do with it because instead of working, them just believe. Them just want to go the easy way. Mm. So me always refer to Paul Bogle and some shop. I say, look on them money. Them money are deacon, you know. Yeah. And them money use the church to organize themselves to fight yeah, against, the rebel against, against the system. Them. Rebel against the system. Terrible. So me say, warm to that the spirit in our church that the spirit dead. Why is it that everybody sit back and I wait for your man come deliver them out of them trouble? Them put you another spirit now, your man. Them put another spirit now, you right now. That's why you're still going to play a domino and a drink rum. Boy, I'm here telling you, Mota. Mm. I give thanks and praise to knowledge and I give thanks and praise to the young men ancient when I live to come see the show the way, you know? Yeah, Cause I remember 1963, Mota, the man them did give up. Maybe I won't know what I know right here now. Yeah, man, give thanks, Bridget. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, to be in the church is to be complacent, because that's, well, that's, that's the way they do it. Make you passive, too. Mm -hmm. Especially and, now. Yeah, of course. And in my whole research and, 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 and medicine of this whole thing, I come up with a thing called the, the, the superhero complex or the superhero ideal. Mm. Yeah? When you, let well, me explain that. When you check out like Revelation, yeah? Mm. And, and majority or most Christians like to refer to this book mm. a lot. The end days when, you know, the trumpet sound yeah, and I'm the a Gideon. Trick, I'm a Gideon. Right? Yeah. And, and all evil doers shall be smite and all good shall be brought up to heaven they look at that as the true revelation of all things so when them see anything bad happening them say no we leave it alone because you know it's just a sign of end days the end days yeah he can't do anything can't do about about the, doing the prophecy that. don't tell you that's so it's going to go already hmm? yeah the prophecy exactly. don't tell you that's so it's going to go so exactly. you can't do nothing about it so them play along with it not knowing that these problems are they Man make it, it and they make it. Of we course, create it, it and we can stop it. But that's what we're getting now to, to the whole superhero thing. Yeah, yes, yeah? Yeah. Where you're waiting for one day Superhero, Superman, Superman, to fly Superman out of the and sky Batman, yeah, man. And come and save you. And some know some are youth, you know. You know, say, oh, me know some are youth because I think the same like you. Mm. And some know some are youth because the same way you think I see him, I think. Same way. Same way. look for a Batman or a Superman to come out. When them are create the mischief. Them. And them refuse to acknowledge these problems and face them head on. But you see, the next thing when we praise that, you see, mankind like to be lied to. Yeah. You see me? Yeah, man, they prefer the lie, man. They lie sweetly more yeah. than the truth. Yeah, man. The truth bitter. And them say ignorance is bliss, you know, and it's they lie to because you ignorance is a bliss. I want to tell anybody who watching or anybody who, 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 who want to watch the first hour the Matrix movie. Yeah. You have to watch the whole thing or the other two movies. You know, there's a black woman right that. You know, there's a black woman right it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, right black woman right the Matrix, man. Believe yeah, me. Man. Yeah, man. When you look into the first hour of the Matrix and what is happening to Neo and the message that message. Morpheus is sending yeah, to him. Big message there, the man. It's big a big message, message yeah, man. because it relates to what is happening here and now with all of us. Oh, yeah. me don't know you, brethren. Oh, me don't know you. I, you, 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 I see him and me think like, hey, I forgot to know you, you know, because you think on the same line with me, I think you are. Yeah, Muta. I forgot to know you, man. How much are you, Bridget? I'm 22. Watch there. I could have been your grandfather. Mm. <laughs> I could have been your father. Father, you father, mean? father. Yeah, man. And we have one day we meet still. Yeah, Bridget. What do you mean, Muta? All right. But you see, the, the, the matrix show you 
that that we 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 have become so docile in the system and we yeah. become so complacent in the way yeah, things right. are and the way things are going that even if change happens we know we never notice uh, we accept it we accept it yeah and it's like i was having an argument with my friend the other day about the whole new world order thing and i don't like to call it that because it has some um conspiracy connotations towards it well that, because it's a, it's a conspiracy not true still you know people yeah. why make you feel the conspiracy up your line not about. necessarily you know but i don't want to give it that yeah yeah me understand, me understand vibe towards it it's but, like when you know like said chicken gun yeah <laughs> right, right. Feature, it, it can't be african and chicken gun array and me call it for years <laughs> right yeah. Buddha. so we're arguing about it and him look at me and say that that can't happen because mankind will never allow it I'm look at him straight and I say, but how you know it's not happening right now? Mm, it could course. be taking place right now and you never know because all you are is do, all you're doing is going along with the trend, with the way the world is moving. Yes. And mm. nobody is there to stop it. So nobody not do nothing about this. Yeah, nobody not do nothing. Uh, watch yeah. out for move, Bridget, you hear? All right, Muta. No worry, man. Move shout out. No worry, no worry. No worry. No worry. Yes. Cutting. Cutting edge. Oh, yes, blessed. Yes, respect, Sam. Hey, Mota. Yes, sir. I'm calling you, please, but now it's on the same program, you know, from the yard, you know, Virgin. Because I went to that talk to my brother and I asked him, boy, you know. So where they know? Where they know? So, you know, I knew you after there. Oh, I knew you after there, all right. So, I asked my brother, if he if didn't know you, I said, yeah. He might, he might say, do you fuck up to 12 times? Because I don't think you can carry up there, like, Every one of them last, the last days when I meet them, I keep by the last Sunday. I never remember. I have a lot. Me used to that trip tribe. Me used to that trip tribe. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, man, I mean, if you know him, man. You know, you used to that trip tribe. You used to that trip tribe, too, you know. Yeah, man, I know that. Come on, come on. I'm a good editor. I'm a good editor. Yeah, man, I'm a good editor. 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 I'm a good Mm, you know the same thing with you, the but in 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 the the bank street, the map, in, in, you can look him up, man. He's wicked, he's wicked, man. Power went twenty fifth street in the bank. He sell book power one twenty fifth yeah, street. Yeah, yeah, eh? yeah, man, one twenty fifth. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I yeah, I think I come in contact with him already. Yeah, man. I think I come in contact with him. See, 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 man. I I beat it. I don't give it to the most in there, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's about the time, man. I'm going to tell my man to go and be to be a man. I'm going to be a man. I'm going to be a man. I'm 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 not trying to there, you know? Well, we don't know. We're just going through, you know? We can't make that stop with still. We have to go through. No fear, no fear, man. I'm with you. 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 i am with <laughs> oh, that's how the that's how your auntie are telling the people. Yo, you have nothing to do. Yes, you understand, sir. And the youth, they must start from you. That's why we now let my youth come in the slavery and the church. Boy, come like your youth, I was starting to say you're a madman, so because your auntie, because the auntie. No, man, you know, say, you know, say, honestly, still, she listen, whatever they are saying. She mm. watch the thing with me and chat and like Okay, that. well, that good, that good, that good. Yeah, but she not really see them here like she would or she to race me like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. All right, Bridget, give yeah, thanks. Yeah, but today I wish the man give thanks more time. Yeah, man, all right, man. Uh, respect. All right. Yeah, the man called Ken Booth. Album called Journey. Music called New World Order. 
Yes, cutting edge. Yes, good night, Uncle Muta. Kev. Ah, uh, how you doing, man? Good, man. How you do, sir? I'm there. I know I got you again, you know. Do the work. I got you. Sister Charlotte, they're on YouTube for a long time, see anybody we are Ah, see, you know? they know, so, so that, that's sickle now, that's sickle. That's sickle. Yeah, sickle. That's I, think, I think Sister Charlotte, they know that something like that, and it pop up, it pop up. Yeah. yeah. I know it's sickle. Beautiful. See, I'm a whole heap yeah. of problem, you know. <laughs> yeah, a whole heap of time to go burn it, you know. No, well, I so, know that I'm going for burn it. Like how the young people a while ago, you know, the young learners were thinking, few things for them, you know. Yeah, because you there, yeah, man. Man, yeah, I, I, I don't take our reasoning. I see you, you know? know? That's what I listen to Sister Charlotte a few times, still, and you're coming like it's like a horror movie, really, when you're having things, you know? <laughs> that means it too. <laughs> no. We are telling you, it's a horror yeah, movie. Yeah, I heard too. some horrible things, man. Hey, I should just have talk about a little bit, you know? Hey, they, they have some movie where they make, you know? They make it, you know? And if they must show you some things where they do, you would believe, say, yeah, 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 the matter about Muslim do this and people Buddhist eating to this and this. And, hey, if you ever know some things with them people they do in the church, in the Rasta, yeah, in the monastery, the man in the convent, them, you know. She had talked about some things they right now, and there's no reason for this belief, you know, because, give, hey, my, yes, my mother, give thanks to my mother, you know, because my mother, you used to read about Europe more than I should read about Africa. And as she oh, make me come know about all certain things we are going in Europe, then, you know, King James and yeah. you know, I hear I hear a daughter on TV I say King James was not homosexual and I tell her I say I say where she get them things the from and which book she read and which where, where she get that history the from to say him is not. When all of the history me read and it's not people were against it. I, I write it. It's it, it just him. It's just so him stay. I mean, it's, 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 it's that. Him but you said about the deep analogy book. I want to get a copy of the deep uh, analogy book. Yeah, you know, so when, 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 when my mother used to tell me about the history, you know, Marco Polo and, you know, Sir Francis Drake. And at and school, me go learn about them things, you know. And my yeah. mother, me hear a listener and listen to them something there. So when me come get interested in them things, you know, me I say, if you understand African history, more time you have to go in Europe too. Yeah. Yeah, you can't just isolate yourself. If, 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 you, do, if you know this the big African scholars like Ben Yokanan and Shekanti Diop, the man they know European history like the back of them yes. head, you know. Yeah. Yes. But so. they really come and disrupt African history, Europeans, you know? Yeah, man, you, you, have, know, you, have have study, you know, have to study with, um, Europe. With like third people. Hmm? And... You realize them not really in a Catholic, you know, because they must say, boy, you want to know, say, the Pope are wicked and things. But me I say, the things that they do, the way they practice on that church will hand down to you. Yeah. So it's like, they may follow really, and we don't tell them that they must say, boy, you know, it's a wicked and thing. But me used to go to church still in and used to take our communion, see? They're and me never understand what I do, but when you talk now, I say, boy, you drink your wine and you eat the bread. And thing and yeah, it becomes the body of Jesus, man. Yeah, and 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 the wine supposed to turn the blood. Me at the time, me never no, me never understand. Me just go and do yeah, and yeah, follow, and, follow, yeah, follow, 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 yeah, man. Then so when me are looking at them, me I say, whoa, you know, the next thing I to this prayer breakfast thing. Why them no go down at the place? So go go a place where only for crime and commit and, and and do this on a communal level with the people them. Because them want yeah, to long in a hotel with air condition and so long round table with different fork where for cut that and different knife where for cut that. And believe say yeah. Jesus and listen to them. Because they might pray for the land. Look how, how much people there. One thousand people get murdered in a jungle mm -hmm. last year. And we don't talk about car accident. We don't talk about death from disease where people and them wrong food and bad food. Yeah. Yes. You know, so, you know, I mean, and, and, and a couple thousand more that, you know. When I talk about yeah, chick I, 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 My man married my wife and picked me. A uh, wife and sent me recently. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I didn't yeah. I got I, and say, we can't just sit down and wait for somebody to continue this. We personally, and we have to do the thing before it happens to we. I've noticed people we do things, you know, but then we wait till it happens to them. They must say, Lord, let's just sit. I'm a disabled that was. 
you should have waited for it happen to somebody. You should have taken it so personal, like you say. When we get, get us together, or even now we go march out, that's how we write newspaper, yeah, yeah, we yeah, call yeah. radio station, or you understand? Yeah, but yeah. nobody now, just like the people, them have so much money for IMF, or JPS, or we party them in the room. You don't know. You don't know what I'm tell you. You know? Yeah. No one like they no business. Rapper so we have a go on, Bridget. Rapper so we have a go on. Another year, I know. We on them, you know. So give thanks. Rich, you know, send big up yourself. Yeah, man. Give thanks. Step in to my little more, said we. Continent with Muta Baruka. We are listening to now all of it. You know here. Continent. The end. The end. Yes, Muta. Yeah, blessed. Blessed love. Alhamdulillah. Blessed love. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, man. I listen to you now, boy. I listen yes, to you. Yes, man. No, no, no. Sorry. Yeah, man. Alhamdulillah. My daughter, I listen to me. If I really need to talk to Yeah, man. I listen to you. But you have to listen to the phone. If you listen to me. Yeah, you may listen to me. Alhamdulillah. Um, you know, when you mention Taki, and say, you know, the Minister of Security, would not please with Taki. Mm. It's like you make me think now and then if you read the book, you lose if you real. If what? If you read the book, you lose if you real. No, I'm not reading. And Who write that? Who write it? Um, sister from the Upper U University, Sister Sultan. Oh, no, I'm not Yeah, no, no. from Upper U University. Oh, oh it really is. Oh, it really is. Yeah, it's about the Maroons. Mm. And this, you see, they are, um, the city there, the city there, um, the way you call it uh, uh, Al Kadul or something like that. Mm. You understand where the Maroons, yeah. Maroons them did, um, did the Moors had all spent for 800 years. Mm. And when they came to Jamaica as navigators, you understand, and Taki was also a Muslim, mm. you know, because his name is. Uh, yeah? Yeah? Well, I'm credit done. And credit done. It's mind control. Mind control. Bridget, you have to get some more credit, Rasta. Yo, Muta, respect. Oh, all right, sir. Listen, man. Yeah, first time I'm here. You know what, no? Me just come in and me hear the tip. What is like, um, realize me did it for a long, long time. Yeah, man, I know time I played, man. Enough time. Yeah, Give so, up here the well, most. Yeah, when I say this, when I listen a while ago now, me, want, me did want to find out if the girl really did get out after. No, that's why I should tell the story, man. Yeah, I guess what she really get out. Yeah, man, she doesn't you put the thing in the, in the, 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 the rubbish pan and the man seats. Man, and the, I, I saw she, yeah. I, you know that she get to because she had tell the story. Yeah, because too, she sound like when she got to the door, you know, one next big door, they did have a lock again, you understand? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But she yeah. got to say, most likely, I guess what she get out, right? Yeah. All right, yeah. you want next up, man, she said to you now. Um... I can't remember where Angie, Angie had his name, you know? Kabu. Kabu, right? Mm. She did ask about um, Dr. Rodney. Walter Rodney. So, Walter Rodney, right? What you ask so, about him, say? What you ask about him, say? Uh, the way she, the way I'm dead, you understand? Okay. So, I didn't have a book, but I saw them book that it print. Mm. So, I didn't have the last edition, it named mom. Um, Covert action, I know them 1980 mm. election. They were on, um, what's the guy named Philip Agee, one ex CIA. Yeah, CIA man, yeah, and, yeah. And them did write the book, mm. the two books. Mm. But President Jimmy Carter did, um, did ban the last version, part mm. two. Mm. They have the part two, my okay. friend, and you know, get it back. get me up, you know, seeing, but I don't know if you have any way can go up on the computer. The book they have in a bully thing and everything about Walter and you know, they kill him and thing with the walkie talkie and such like. You yeah, understand? And blow, and blow it up and thing. 
Yes, with the Pandi, the last round, you know, with the Pandi soon, you know, Rebel Salute this Friday, I remember Rebel Salute this Friday and Saturday, so we will be there, this is the coaching edge and I refer to give thanks to the moment, give thanks to the time, give thanks to the energy, give thanks to steer with me, you know, it's a little more from this with there with the stepping razor, the art of war.